facilities, including our athletics track, sports pitches and courts. And for companies, check out our team building days, conference facilities and events. All this and more at sportirelandcampus.ie. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. All right, a very good morning to you. Welcome along this Monday morning. Bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, aren't you, with their uh, New Year's resolution in your back pocket? Completely not broken over the course of the weekend. How are you getting on with yours? Very well. Uh, what are, what, what? Well, sorry, how am I getting on with my New Year's any? resolutions? Not really. Uh, my New Year's resolution, I think, for everybody on, what is it, the 6th of January is... Start going to bed earlier. It's happy uh, bio clock day to everybody who slept for one or two hours last night. Yeah, and then um, I didn't couldn't couldn't get sleep at all last night. Neither could I. And I wasn't even watching the NFL. I was like, okay, I'm gonna gonna watch highlights this tonight. First day of work back for a while. Um, Tommy's like, what are you doing? I mean, I've been here the whole time. But anyway, that's a different story. Uh, I I couldn't sleep. For anybody who's waking up this morning disappointed that they stayed up all night watching the NFL, don't worry, you made the correct decision. You did. Because I, I went to bed before the second game kicked off and I managed to actually see the full-time score before I went to sleep, before I <laughs> eventually got to sleep. So that was hugely pointless uh, activity trying to, to put the head down before that point. Um, but we will be on track eventually. It was the excitement of coming in here to tell everybody about the glorious world of sport that we're looking forward to for the next decade, right? The start it. of a new decade, it's a, it's a big thing. It's the start of a new it decade. It only happens three or four times in your life if you're... <laughs> If you're unlucky and you you know, cards right. seven times max. It, it's, and it feels fresh. It feels new. It, it feels like uh, everybody has just wanted to hop on a brand shiny new green bandwagon of some description. Yeah. And Irish football has come along and delivered us this. They gave us the hope in 2019 that this new thing would bring us into a, a golden age. And then, lo and behold, the first weekend of football of the decade, this happens. Some, some great Irish performances, an Irish hat-trick in the greatest competition in the history of sport. Well, the, the oldest, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we're, we're back on track. The decade has started well. Yeah, and we're all going to have to learn to pronounce Adam Ida, Adam Ida, as opposed to Adam Ida, which is what we'd all been pronouncing it until we went and looked up the BBC video. They did our research this morning. We've also started on the right foot. Yeah. We can confirm Adam Ida himself says his uh, name is Ida, not Ida. Yeah, which is good that we all know that. Imagine how amazing we would feel about the future of Irish football if all that was happening was what was bubbling up in the underage, if, if there was none of the administrative stuff, right? And maybe the performance of the senior national team was a little bit better, you know, maybe if we qualified automatically. But we can just park the Mick McCarthy for a minute. It's a new, new, new decade. Mick McCarthy thing is definitely going to end. Well, and Stephen Kenny is very familiar with all these young fellas who are playing really well. Mm. I mean, they're not all playing really well, but most of them are playing very well. And he knows them. He knows them very well. And wants them to play. And has been contributed and has been kind of mentioned in the development of a, a lot of these uh, players. Like just reading up uh, on a bit of Adam Eda this morning. So there was a, a guy involved in, in, with Norwich, uh, Robert Flanagan, who's their former Ireland-based talent scout. He's the guy who spotted Eda at the Kennedy Cup years ago when Norwich uh, initially got their eye in and they thought that they wanted this guy. He said that, that Stephen Kenny could basically tell him to work his bollocks off or feck off. The change in his work rate and hunger now matches his talent. He really works hard in every game I see as a result of Stephen Kenny basically treating him fa fairly harshly, I'd imagine, because the one thing that people said about Edith's game when he was young was that he just lacked a bit of work rate. He had all the natural ability in the world, but just lacked that bit of work rate. Like, this is the sort of, one, one of the many anecdotes we start to hear about the man yeah. and the work he's done with these young players. Yeah, we've got to hope that the um, international team becomes the be-all and end-all for a lot of these players because it's going to be harder and harder for them to make it to the Premier League. So if you're a championship player and Stephen Kenny is telling you, you know, you've got to shape up or you're not going to play, then you hope that that's going to have an impact in a way that maybe it was more difficult um, in the noughties for Brian Kerr to tell everybody, or for Chris Hewton at that stage, before he'd been a, a manager at, um, in the Premier League. I, maybe not. Maybe that wasn't what, what prevented that era from being a success. But um, 
you would definitely hope that that connection that he has with these young players helps immediately to have an impact. You would have thought so. Like what, what I would always say is that there there is a trend developing in football, and it has been for fifteen to twenty years now at this point, and it isn't helping the international game whatsoever. They don't pay your wages. Norwich City will be funding Adamida's life for the foreseeable future, and it will be hard to, to wrestle influence away from the club in any position that you're in. That being said. There has been a sort of situation as well with Irish players over the past few years that successful international campaigns where, like, say, Euro 2016, for example, Jeff Hendrick would have benefited hugely from being involved in an international setup. It's not entirely a one way street where, you know, your club uh, comes first and your influence on the international team comes as a result of your club. It can work the other way as well. And if these young players realise that they've got a player or they've got a manager and a coach who's helped them successfully to actually get first team starts, then their ear is probably going to continue to be open and listen to this guy. Yeah, you'd hope so. Um, we're going to speak with Keith Andrews a little bit later on about that. Um, going to look back across the weekend's GA. You were at some of the games over the the, uh, the winter break. <laughs> okay. You saw your beloved Kerry get spanked, right? I saw, saw my beloved Kerry get spanked by Cork. They considered like 6-18 to Cork in the McGrath Cup. I mean, I know, you know, it doesn't matter, right? But at the same time, that'll get Cork. Just a little bit happy, wasn't it? It was a big roar when Cork scored their, their opening uh, goal. Like Cork, obviously, are entering into a, a National League campaign where they're literally saving their status yeah. as a Tier 1 county because which, they have which, to get promoted. Which, let's face it, is exactly what you want. If you're, if you're the Cork management team, suddenly every single training session has an impact early on in the year. Suddenly every decision that's being made is going to have an impact. There you go, there's your, there's your picture of the old firm. Just to clarify, the Kerry team had flown on holidays like... Two, three days before that, so the Kerry team went on holidays. Yeah, yeah. So there, there was no, um, there was there was no senior players involved. This is from a week ago. But uh, Kieran Sheehan was playing for Cork. That I day. Can't, was, couldn't believe it. He was back. Kieran Sheehan was one of my favourite players. It was like he was sensational. I saw, I, I saw his back, and I was like, is he back, back? And he is back, back. He's back, back. He looked very, very good. Did he? Ah, I'm so excited. Like granted, against an 18 year old fullback. Look, but, I'm going to uh, take it. The little breadcrumbs. You could, uh, he was sensational. Yeah. Do you have proper memories of like how amazing he was? Now. Maybe this is one of those with the passage of time, Andy Reid type situations, but like I just remember being completely enthralled by his abilities. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny that you're saying that you're, you're you're starting to sound like Mickey Hart and just a, a different accent this morning, blaming uh, the <laughs> AFL for all uh, Cork's ills. Uh, having the the absence of Kieran Sheen was a humongous thing, and then when you hear him coming back, uh, it is this huge boost that they have himself and Ian McGuire on on that occasion just looked uh, men against boys for sure in those two occasions, and that, the corner four that Cork have. I uh, can't remember his first name, my apologies, but Gore is his surname. He looks like an absolutely unbelievable Damien. Gore. Damien Gore, sorry. Um, but yeah, so Kieran Sheehan fits in nicely with the whole narrative that we've got over the last 12 to 24 hours. Of he's only 29. He's only 29? Yeah. So he's got even a year of allowing himself to bed back in before hitting top gear. But this Cork team, we're going to see something good for them in the early section of uh, this calendar year because they need to be good in the early section of the calendar year. They need to, to get promoted from Division 3 or else they'll be playing a Tier 2 championship barring an upset against Kerry in the summer. But um, they'll certainly be happy with the way that that trend has gone. Like the other thing, and it's like barring the, the, the four games at the weekend, like the big story that we come into this Monday morning is Mickey Hart being the latest manager to slam the unnamed GA people who are working with the AFL, Ty Canelli, I presume. And is, is there others? Is this Ty Canelli the only one? Uh, is there not somebody here who runs the combine for them? There probably is, in fairness. But Mickey Hart has come out and said that, you know, uh, Carl McShane, he's going to try his best to persuade Carl McShane, or Carl McShane would be doing well to be aware of the lavish lifestyle that comes with being a footballer for Tyrone. He should definitely consider staying at home rather than going to Australia and following his dreams, and that these people who are former GEA men should not be involved in helping funnel Irish talent down under. Um, but they all went off and had amazing lives for themselves, and they're like, oh, look, you can come aboard my, my this room in this Hollywood lounge for all of us, which is exactly what you'd hope people would do, instead of pulling the ladder up behind them, right? For sure, and uh, it's something that we're going to get into uh, in the papers as well this morning. Like over the course of the weekend, uh, like I'm not sure if you see this, but I know we're kind of doing a quick round of everything that happened this weekend. But well, Ballyhale against Schlott Neil, already up there as one of the, the sporting contests of the year so far. You hate to patronise any team, 
But when a team is 10 to 1 outsiders going into a two horse race and they put in the sort of performance they put in yesterday, you can't help but kind of venture in that way of moral victories in the feet. Like a lot of people have known about Brendan Rodgers as the Derry footballer, the great Derry footballer over the last decade or so, or maybe not even a decade at this point. Uh, I'll be embarrassed enough to put up my hands and say I haven't seen enough of him play hurling in the Schlott Neal jersey over the last few years. But yesterday was one of those opportunities where you're just taken aback by him. That goal that he got late on uh, was Rambo esque. The problem is that Colin Fenley was even more Rambo esque in the way he managed to just uh, dark through players, uh, men hanging off him, and finish that goal late on to kill the contest. It was sublime, and it came down to the fact that Bally Hale have two of the best forwards in the country right now. At club level, that will win you everything. And it'll probably be too much for Boris Ali, despite the fact that they will have uh, their own superstar in their ranks. Oh, Brendan Maher. Yeah. Brendan Maher's point with the, the oh, shitty Harold. stick. Yeah. Um, My favourite part about that was, and I'm sure it wasn't deliberate, was that Brendan Maher actually goes shouting to everybody saying, give me a hurl, give me a hurl, so that we could all uh, know at home that he did indeed <laughs> do it with a broken hurl. I know. No, I'm not joke. He obviously didn't. I like, was, uh, like, it was just... It was just five days too late to be included in 2019, which would have been like, do we, can we just give out the 2019 Hurler of the Year Award at the end of the year so we can include all of this as well? It's like, I mean, obviously we had a very worthy winner of Hurler of the Year, but when you think back to what Brendan Maher's job was in the championship, nullifying so many of the opposition's mm -hmm. best players, we still haven't found a role. Like, we're going to talk NFL a little bit later on, but the NFL have like loads of awards where there's Offensive Player of the Year, there's MVP, there's Defensive Player of the Year. Like... We, and they're all equal. Well, the MVP is obviously the most one because I think that's the one you get the truck for. But um, there, there should just be more Hurler of the Year awards. There should be a defensive Hurler of the Year and an attacking Hurler of the Year. It's almost as if you've come up with a great item for off the ball this December. All right. It's, or it's, maybe it's, it's, we could do it retrospectively in January for last year and it's good that would prove our case and we can make the case for the whole year and try and affect some change. All about affecting change this year. Here's what's coming up on the show this morning. Uh, sports page is coming your way. Um, we're a minute late with that. It is 7.41 this morning. If um, you're just tuning in, you're very welcome along. Uh, football with the FA Cup, we're talking about that. Keith Andrews is going to join us for a quick call about Adam E there around about 8.15. We're going to talk about Mickey Hart and the club GAA over the course of the weekend at around about 25 minutes past 8 this morning. Sports news with Tom at 8.35. Rugby with Alan Quinlan. An interesting weekend um, as we build up to the return of the European Heineken Cup this weekend and uh, not a great weekend for Connacht and probably starting to pose some existential questions about what happens with Irish rugby and then we're going to talk with Mike Carlson around about five past nine this morning and then Deal or No Deal, the latest iteration of Deal or No Deal coming your way at 9.15. Time now for the papers. OTB AM all right, going to start with the Irish news this morning because obviously um, the big news in the GAA world is Hart. GAA should cut all ties with AFL. Now, in fairness to Mickey Hart, this is not something new that he's been saying. He's been saying this about the international rules for a long, long time. Um, uh, I'd say as far back as Mickey Hart becoming prominent at senior inter-county level, he's been saying that um, the international rules wasn't a good idea because actually the AFL are coming over looking for our best players and uh, taking them at heart. GA should cut all ties with AFL. And then also they've got Kilku relishing All-Ireland final against Cora Finn. So um, Kilku are through after their victory against Bally Bowden at the weekend to play Cora Finn. Cora Finn, one of the greatest football teams at club level that we've ever seen. But Kilku managed by Mickey Moran, who was the manager of Slock Neal when they reached um, their All-Ireland final as well. And, uh, you know, one of the GA's great managers, it turns out. Yeah, he, he certainly is. That's... What do, you, what do you think about McShane? I think if you're in Colin McShane's shoes and you want to go live a professional lifestyle, you go and do it. So Colin McShane looks at what he's achieved so far and he's put in the best year of his career to date in 2019 and still you suspect the Tyrone are a good jump away from winning an All-Ireland medal. Now, maybe there are greater things that you have to strive for if you're an inter-county player because only one county can win Sam in any given year, but perhaps Colin McShane is weighing up his options now and thinking to himself, I will not win in All-Ireland as long as this Dublin team exists and as long as this perhaps this Kerry team is getting better, who knows. But perhaps I look around myself in the dressing room and I can't actually see an All-Ireland medal in, the, in this dressing room. Or perhaps it's different to that. Perhaps he doesn't like his job. Perhaps he actually likes travelling and he actually wants to get paid for becoming a professional athlete. And he's now got the opportunity to do this. So fair play to him. Go and test it out. Go see what happens. Because... Like, there is nothing the GEA can really offer that will come close to being a professional athlete. I'm sure every GEA player loves playing sport, number one, and doing everything else, number two. Didn't Kerry have that document that they were issuing to young lads who were being tempted? Yeah, and like, 
fair use of them for producing that, doing everything within the GEA's power to actually keep them, giving them potential college courses, career options that will allow you to stay not only in the country but in the county and not actually have to, to go too far uh, away from home to actually provide yourself with a living. Now, I'm sure Mickey Hart is having those conversations, which, and I'm not sure that Tyrone have an official document. They can do everything, but the one thing they can't do is give you money to play football. The one thing the AFL can do is give you money to play football, and that is where this, this is what this boils down to. Now, let's, let's just, that's, that, we know they can't officially do that, but that's not true, right? So we, we know of various hurlers and footballers in the past who have been professional for a year or two. David Brady said that he took a year off from work and ended up being a professional footballer for a year. Um, one of the Clare hurlers at one stage took a year off and was essentially... Like, it, it does happen. There are, there are benefactors out there who will come in and somehow, and I'm not suggesting that Tyrone would ever do this, but like the notion that players aren't getting paid to play somewhere around the country isn't really that true, is it? It, it, it isn't, but it's almost like the smoke and mirrors that goes along with that, that you're kind of... Uh, it's, it feels dishonest. It, it, there's a shame about it almost, and I, 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 that's probably too strong a word. Oh, you're right, you're right. Actually, there is a shame about it, isn't there? There's like a, a sense that this can't happen. We, we, you know, like, we, <laughs> what do you tell people? You know, what, what are you doing at the moment? Oh, I'm playing a bit of ball. How are you, how are you, you know, I, are you looking after your career? What are you going to do when you're finished doing that? Like, there's no, oh, it's grand, I have a pension because I'm being looked after properly. There's also It's, it's backdoor bullshit. It, totally, and, but there's also the kind of shiny example that the likes of Canelli's have brought where they're actually maintaining a sporting career in that professional game in Australia after their game. Like, it's not just kind of a, a one-stop shop where you play your career, you play your game, you come home with a broken body. There has been a couple of examples of huge success stories. Now, granted, it is weighed against you, but Colin McShane has turned out to be one of the best physical forwards the game has at the moment. So he's in a great better place better. to make it. Absolutely. Well, I, I mean, let's wait and see. Though. It'll be really amazing to see if he does actually make it. Let's hear what the, the interview that uh, Mickey Hart did with the uh, BBC. Have a listen to this. All I can say is that um, he has been uh, wooed by some people in the AFL uh, and I think he's gone out there for a few days to experience what that might be like. Um, there's no final decision made yet of whether he's going to go or whether he stay with us, but at the moment he's certainly considering that move. I'm sure you've been talking to him. Have you tried to persuade him to stay here, that his future should be with Tyrone? Well, I wasn't actually, I suppose, not persuading wasn't the right word. I was trying to enlighten him to the fact that, you know, there's lots for him, lots of good things can happen for him staying here and the things that he's going out there to try to do are very much more variable. Um, as you would know, um, I've not been a fan of the, the engagement we've had with the AFL over many, many years now and I think that's the sad thing about it. It used to be in the past we had uh, unknown Australians trying to woo our players out to their AFL league. Now we have Ex Gaelic players doing it, which really saddens me that that's what we've got now. We've got recruits for the AFL within our own ranks of the GA, and that's that's sad. Do you see that almost then like the enemy within? Well, it's, it's something that you knew was going to happen. Um, all you need to do is get a few players out there first and get them sort of involved to some degree. And we find that most of them come home and haven't made it out there at all, and often don't even play as good a Gaelic football when they get back. Uh, but now they've got a different role now they can be agents for the AFL and it's an absolute free gamble for them if our players succeed out there that's a cheap gamble and if they don't they send them back home to us to see can we continue to play football with them um, It's kind of characterising the players as having no agency in this like having no brain power no individual thought process no desire to go and do something different right it's like a, these these people within the these ex GA players are having a free gamble at uh, it's kind of it's, it's unusual language to use about people giving an opportunity to somebody to better themselves i guess it comes out to you don't see it as bettering yourself they're not brainwashing the, these young players there should be some sort of um base of what these players know and what they love about Gaelic football to stop them going if you feel so strongly about the GEA and maybe that isn't strong enough in a lot of cases and that's fine too like it's it, you can draw a, a small parallel I know Dick Clerkin's writing about it this morning in the, the Irish Independent a small parallel between this and perhaps players leaving the inter-county fold and staying away from the game the likes of your or McNeilish's and it's not too dissimilar to this conversation as well that Perhaps there just isn't enough to uh, to lure you 
about the GEA, about being an intercounty footballer or a herder at the moment, unless you're winning games and consistently challenging at the top table and have a high profile and you can kind of earn legitimately on the side or uh, whatever the case may be, that it, it's not entirely different to the situation where these footballers are ripe for picking, as I'm sure Mickey Hart might agree with from, from the AFL, that if there's players dropping off of their own will from intercounty panels, then they are easy targets from the AFL. Now, that being said, the players <laughs> have their own minds. These are grown adults. And that's, I think that's exactly right. They're, 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 you couldn't tempt people who didn't want to go if the situation here was perfect. The situation is clearly not perfect. Mm. People are leaving of their own free will. And uh, it's, all, it's all part of the same story. Like, one of the funniest comments underneath the... Um, there was a the Mickey Hart interview on Twitter. One of the funniest comments was, well, I'll let him go. At least he'll know when his games are. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. Exactly. All of this, all of this is all a fixtures problem. And the demands and the, like, when am I playing for my club? When am I playing for my county? Who's looking after my body? He goes and has a professional career doing something he really likes and like might be good at. He might be no good at it, but he'll come back at 25 if he's no good. You know, body broken, you know, all that. Ah, oh, like, really, will they, will, they, will they break his body? Or will they actually look after him properly? Because they'll have the best medical and the players' union are really strong and like, they'll actually make sure that he comes back, if he comes back uh, physically well. Whether or not he wants to play football again would be another thing. I mean, that's a that's a different issue, but that that's up to the individual counties to make sure that they're providing a great environment and an opportunity to learn for the players. Yeah, right? but it's also at the very worst, he comes back a more interesting character. And if uh, there isn't enough about the GA right now to keep him at home, then uh, I think that's a price worth paying. It screws Tyrone in terms of their ability to beat Dublin, right? Definitely, but like their their ability to beat Dublin at the moment. Is everybody not thinking the dubs are there, you know? Cluxton's still not back officially. New oh, manager in. How, how hungry are the team who've delivered history going to be, really? They're not going to be that hungry, right? Come on. Surely over Christmas you talked yourself into, this is our year. What, you mean when I was watching Cork 618, Kerry, whatever it was? Yeah, the young uh, lads are great. There's like <laughs> two or three of those young lads who are going to file that away, let their small hatred of Cork flame up so that in the summertime they're punching lads. Dublin players have spent all Christmas in Bally thinking to themselves, right, time to step out of Jim Gavin's shadow. Six in a row is on, we're going to do it without Jim. And they've, I think they've been lying in Bally having their belly tickled. That's what, I mean, they deserve it. That's all part of the belly tickling process, believing that you can step out of your manager's shadow. <laughs> is it? I'm sure it is. Uh, right, we'll come back to that. Uh, the Irish Independent this morning, their back page. It's Tip versus Kilkenny all over again. So, uh, Mara Rolex helped Barca Lee to all Ireland final date with Shefflin's all conquering Ballyhale after Cat's kingpins survived Schlock Neil scare. And so they've got uh, loads of pages on that. They've also got a picture of Adam Ida up there. Um, his hat trick exploits give reason to believe in a 2020 vision for Ireland. It's Don McDonald saying we should all be excited about the fact that there are loads of good players coming through. And then uh, Club's kids prove there's still magic in the cup. This is Eamon Sweeney after. Um, <laughs> After our Liverpool put their new signing straight in the team, start the game. Yeah, Minamino uh, should have scored. Uh, basically, headed fresh air with a beautiful cross from the left flank, uh, and should have netted on his debut. Definitely would have been the winner. Instead, Curtis Jones steps up and bags an unbelievable winner. Uh, nothing Jordan Pickford could do. Just this flailing arm, trying to get at something that was just perfectly into the top right corner. This is the same fellow that scored a winning penalty against Arsenal in the Carabao Cup in that crazy 5 all draw. So he's building a bit of pedigree. He's on BBC after the match, and they're like, so how does it feel, blah, blah, blah. Not even a leading question. He's like, yeah, I've been really frustrated with my game time. A teenager comes on, scores in the FA Cup, playing with the best team in the world. He's frustrated about his game time. He's clearly got bags of confidence. Uh, you, you kind of love to see the swagger in a couple of these uh, Liverpool youngsters. And... I don't really have a dog in the fight in the Merseyside derby, but there is uh, a sense of black comedy about how the Everton first team got beaten by the Liverpool second team, plus, you know, I guess James, James, Joe Gomez, James Milner, perhaps, Adam Lallana. They're, they're full-grown adults, at least. It's not, it's not totally comparable to the Liverpool against Aston Villa game in, in the Carabao Cup, but it's still hilarious if you're a Liverpool fan, I'd imagine. Most of my um, family viewing time at the weekend was spent watching uh, Dancing on Ice, I'm not going to lie. Great excitement in our house about dancing on ice. I did, I'm not going to lie, put it on for a little bit on uh, Saturday evening. 
Just to so see. Saturday, Saturday was just the introduction. Sunday was the real thing. It's, it's Sunday was the real thing, but Kevin wasn't uh, dancing. Well, he was part of uh, the group. The group. So this is this is so you know Michael Barrymore's in it, right? I, I I do know this. So Michael Barrymore broke his arm. Look, Tommy, relax, relax. I'm getting there, right? Tommy's like, oh, oh, oh. Tommy also uh, big on his dancing and nice gossip. So Barrymore broke his arm, right? In and training? They, yeah, in training, like three weeks ago. So they had to get a new guy in to replace him. So they got a new guy in to, who comes in, who skates in, and who's like, his introduction to the whole group is he skates in and he's like, I can't stop, I can't stop, and they grab him and he stops, right? And so the group does their big thing last night. And they, Holly asks the judges here, listen, you know, you've seen the whole group now for the first time together. Is there anybody who needs to brush up on stuff? And they're like, oh yeah, the new guy. And Kev. Oh. Oh. So he's already oh, lagging behind. Oh, he's unnoticed. Time. Kev like nods his head and goes, thanks for that. Yeah. No, he smiles through it. He was like, you know, but I was thinking, you know, the Iceland debut, taken off at halftime by Mick McCarthy, you get it out of your system. That's over, and then you shoot forward to the next. I Pressure's didn't, on. I didn't Pressure's know. Pressure's on. No, this was about to happen. I thought he was good. I was like totally biased, thinking, yeah, no fuck ups there, buddy. Well, you saw Saturday night, though. Like, you, in, in the montage, it shows Kev falling about. Like, there is no. Ah, they're, they're all stuff. falling. They're all falling. But, like, Kev's sob story was just how much he's like, I've, I've got hurt so much on a football pitch, but nothing compares to falling on the ice. And then he's, like, skating over with his partner to Philip and Holly, and he almost lamps himself into the center <laughs> as he's trying to get up off the ice. Uh, it was very entertaining for the five minutes that I watched it, but it will be the full show for, for next week. A couple of people fell last night, so you're like, come on, come on, he's got to beat the, keep the people are falling the first week. So mm. Just don't fall. I didn't realize that Sam Matterface is like a commentating montage post. Uh, he does each one, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's uh, th th there's more sporting elements to this thing than we initially thought. It's I guess. Serious business. You would uh, hope that just like the random football fans are going to vote for Kev as the representative of football. The way that like the GA basically win Dancing with the Stars every year. It's it's true. Is it's it Dancing with the Stars? I mean, is that is that what it's actually called? He won an Ed Nomani then was I don't think he Des was won it, didn't he? Des, no, I didn't think he was the he was the same year as Ed Oh, was he? If my dad's with the stars, he Ireland knowledge is correct. Uh, I, I don't think Dennis Bastic went oh, very he, far. Was last night. I'm not watching it. Okay, he's gonna win, apparently Tommy says. Um Yeah, but you can't vote in Ireland for this. No, no, it's fix. The fix is in. The green vote. They put him in green, they put more in green. I was like, come on, come on, ITV. Mm. You know, there are other colours in our palette. He, he, let's face it, he doesn't stand a chance against Moore. Uh, Connor Joyce says, Colin McShane would probably play zero games out there, so that's clarity anyway. Grass isn't always greener on the other side. We in Ireland are very quick to stamp on the GAA and ourselves. Who's stamping on the GAA? Who, Connor? Tell us that, Connor. Who is stamping on the GAA and who is stamping on ourselves? Because nobody is. And the fact that he's going to play zero games out there, I hope he takes that and tattoos it somewhere inside his brain uh, so that when he does actually end up um, playing and scoring and uh, having a career in the AFL, he can remind you, just very briefly, Richard Sherman, you know, the cornerback who um, used to play for the Seattle Seahawks, mm -hmm. very famous for, um, you can't be a sorry receiver like Crabtree. Yeah, absolutely outspoken uh, union leader. Did his own deal a couple of years ago when he signed for the San Francisco 49ers, which are in the same division as the Seattle Seahawks, um, negotiated his own deal with no agent and had a load of incentives built in. And at the time, the deal was absolutely crucified by the cognoscenti of American football going, oh, this is why you need a lawyer. All the lawyers were like, oh, this is why you need a lawyer. What a stupid deal this man's done. He's clearly very clever. He went to a big college, but look at how stupid his deal is. He made all of his incentives, so basically ended up earning about four million at the end of um, the season, and took to Twitter in a two-hour spree of just reminding everybody who went at him two years ago. He'd, he'd stored them all up. Mm. He kept receipts, he said. I hope, I hope Carl McShane is keeping receipts for all of the people who are like, oh, you're never going to make it anyway, which is basically the tone of uh, Dick Clerkin's piece. In the, you know, he's, got a very, he's got a hard road ahead of him, you know, this stage. Richard Sherman seems like an expert at tattooing stuff on the inside of his brain, which is something that McShane should get good at. It's, um, it's brilliant to have somebody like... Richard Sherman and the team you support. Yeah, well, I'm oh, sure, it's amazing. I'm, I'm sure we'll get into it later on, but like this is this is your week now. This is uh, wh where you start to feel a bit telling dumb. everybody that hey, yeah. everyone, this bandwagon left the station two years ago when Kyle Shanahan and Jimmy G came on board, and I've been on board. I don't I don't see you wearing your 49ers Christmas jumper this morning. I know. It's, get it on for the rest of the week. Not Christmas. I might uh, I might wear it on Friday. Back page of the mirror is my boy wonders Klopp's pride at Curtis and the other cop kids who he insists are now ready for the first team. And Troy Deal-Near, 
Troy Parrott's long-term future at Tottenham looks set to be confirmed, with the club hopefully to put pen to paper on a fresh deal next month. So the Dubliner uh, has attracted interest from Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund, but with 18 months left in his deal, uh, he's held talks and could sign a multi-year extension when he turns 18 on February the 4th. He obviously didn't play yesterday. Jose didn't use all his subs yesterday. Troy Parrott was on the bench yesterday, and they needed a goal yesterday, but uh, still, it seems that he is going to put pen to paper on a new deal. The uh, front of the Irish Times this morning is Munster and Connacht limp back into Europe. That's the headline of Gavin Coventry's piece. We'll um, talk with Alan Quinlan a little bit later on about the situation. The Heineken Champions Cup resumes this weekend. Claremont versus Ulster is Saturday at 1 o'clock. Connacht versus Toulouse, which is the game we have live here on Off the Ball on Saturday afternoon, is from the sports ground at 3.15. On Sunday, it's Leinster versus Leon. That's a one o'clock kickoff in the RDS. And then Racing versus Munster at 4.15 is a huge game for Munster in the context of their overall season. And Klopp's kids serve Ancelotti with painful reality check. That's uh, a Malky Kirkett's column. His Tennessee defeat looks like the end for Brady and hated Patriots. And rampant Leinster exposed golf in class 54-7 victory for uh, Leinster. But it was a point a minute in the first half when it mattered. Yeah, it was a 19 nil after 19 minutes. It was 40 at halftime. That was a 40. Oh God, um, that uh, Ancelotti story. Did you see the one yesterday or the day before about uh, Ancelotti saying that he held talks with Liverpool post Brendan Rodgers? I can imagine how different a place Anfield would be right now had they gone for Carlo Ancelotti rather than Jurgen Klopp. Like Jonathan Norcroft in the Sunday Times yesterday actually did up a graph of uh, so on the x-axis you had quiet to passionate, and on the y-axis you had pragmatic to kind of uh, experimental, uh, experimental with how you actually promote your team. And at the top right you had Klopp, and at the bottom left you had Carlo Ancelotti. Yeah. Like complete polar opposites. And you just, like that is a sliding doors idea that some Liverpool fans just possibly couldn't even tolerate at the moment. Because like we did have fears before Christmas that Everton had got Ancelotti at a bad time. And maybe there's just a situation with the history of his career that he will never be able to overachieve with a team, which is something that Klopp is done to a point. Granted, they've got good resources, but I don't think many Liverpool fans in their wildest dreams could have imagined what's happening so far. Uh, back page of the Irish Daily Star is Smells Like Teen Spirit and Loss of K, No Excuse, says Jose Mourinho. The uh, Racing Post, the winning machine, unbeaten Envoy Allen on track for Cheltenham after grade one victory at Nace. We'll talk about this with Tom Lone around about 8.35 this morning. And Osborne slams NARS quiz for trivialising misconduct allegations. Jamie Osborne has criticised Britain's National Association of Racing Staff for publishing a spoof Christmas quiz to its members that highlights 12 serious allegations the organisation has dealt with in the past year. Uh, and then on the back, it's a taste of things to come. Promotion favourites test Premier League credentials at Arsenal. So Arsenal playing Leeds tonight, apparently uh, for the first time in eight years, seven years, eight years? Nine years, Thierry Henry scored the last time. On his comeback in yeah. 2012. There you go, 2012, yeah. <laughs> we heard that in the office, we're stealing these lines. Uh, I, do, I, do remember, I do remember that. Yeah. All right, okay. It was, I, I completely saw it from the office. It was a, a glorious moment. The, the, the two comebacks that Arsenal tried to make happen this decade, when, or last decade at this point, Henri and Saul Campbell. One worked out relatively well in Henri and then Saul Campbell. It brought him back, I don't know. Anyway, the Daily Telegraph. Teenage sensation, Liverpool's 18-year-old wonder boy Jones seals Merseyside derby win with superb strike and a Mourinho avoid scare. Mora earns Spurs a second shot at Middlesbrough. The uh, back page of the London Times, Super Sibley gets England up for victory charge. England are up against New Zealand, I think, at the minute, are they? Um, Don Sibley produced a breakthrough innings of 85, not out to put England in the box at Newlands yesterday. The Warwickshire opener playing in his fourth test Scored 79, it doesn't say who they're against. Oh, it's in Cape Town, sorry, it must be, there you go. It's obviously against South Africa. Teenagers FA Cup stunner decides Derby, that's the same one. So Curtis Jones had a sensational goal set yesterday's Mercer. Derby was beyond the midfielders. Wildest dreams. The Guardian leads with that story. Jones jumps for joy, bigger than a dream, says local hero after scoring Derby winner. And who had Michael Oliver as the first referee to use the VAR screen? He was the one, he made history yesterday. Crystal Palace nil, Derby won. History made as referee Oliver uses a screen for VAR Red. It's a wonder it's taken this long. The uh, Daily Mail, their back page is Corporal Jones. Did you get it? Co Corporal Jones. Is there a famous Corporal Jones? Am I missing the...? <coughs> there is now. Teen Ace Curtis wins Derby with stunning strike. That's the headline on uh, Dominic King's piece. And um, they obviously also have a picture there. Boris organised a lift to Croker. Um, 
Irish provinces, Euro hopes hobbled by injuries. Injuries is also one of the themes that's come through over the course of the weekend. It's uh, obviously a very busy football schedule and James Milner went down um, just 10 minutes into the game against Everton. Jurgen Klopp very pissed off with both himself and the fact that the fixtures have come so thick and fast. And um, Munster also significantly damaged after the weekend. Niles Scannell, Finian Witcherly and Andrew Conway all forced off in the loss to Ulster on Friday where they're absolutely hammered. Uh, 38-17. James Ryan was subbed off after 25 minutes. He suffered a calf injury, which obviously is important for scrummaging and general running round. And uh, not to mention the situation in Connacht where uh, they are the walking wounded at the moment. The back page of the sun is Klopp kids a Kurt above, teen hero hid illness to play. And final hurrah, Kilkenny will take on tip for the first time in the All-Ireland Club Senior Hurling Championship Final. That's an interesting stat. Um, this one as well, Iran strike cup fears. So fears over the 2022 World Cup in Qatar have grown after a weekend of tension between Iran and the USA. So uh, Qatar is Iran's only major ally in the region, a stance which has put uh, greater concerns, I'd imagine, uh, around the World Cup and the blockade between Saudi Arabia and Qatar, which has kind of put a little bit of a cloud over the, the chances of this World Cup going ahead, a slight cloud I should say, those clouds aren't going anywhere, uh, to put it mildly. Um, and we have the Irish Examiner for you. Uh, so birthday present, Majestic Mar breaks Hurley, taking and converting free, makes a block in the clearance, gets a possession back, points with half a boss on the day he turned 31. Next up for Boris Ali, TJ Reid and Bally Hale. Um, so five pages of uh, hurling action at the start of it. Club Magic, the perfect antidote to wash away January blues. It feels like it's a good thing that these games are on January, no? Certainly when the weather's as good as this. That's for sure, and it'll be even better when they get pushed back into December again, and to get it all done in the one calendar year, and that these players can actually go and enjoy Christmas after perhaps winning in All-Ireland. Yeah, wouldn't that be amazing? It would be perfect, and um, yeah, like it's it, it, clearly, I think we've arrived at a point where the greatest chance of games getting called off will be in February and March. There are two worst months in this country and you often have the trudging weather that they would have for the All-Ireland Club semi-finals in those months. So the, the, the more push, pushes back, the better. But there has been some concerns about whether or not they can get it all played in the one calendar year. Those many concerns tend to be overcome pretty easily uh, when you've got a final date set in stone uh, because quite often these things develop and get out of hand when there isn't something set in stone. But Some breaking news confirmed overnight by the AFL. Um, Adelaide Crows have confirmed that Irish all-star Cahill McShane is set to train with them for two weeks in January. Athletic Irish prospect Cahill McShane is set to train with Adelaide's AFL squad in January. Crows general manager list management and strategy. What a title. Justin Reid confirmed the club will fly the 24-year-old to Australia in the coming weeks. We're looking forward to Carl joining our pre-season training programme and getting to know him a bit better, he said. He has the physical attributes coming in at a touch over 190 centimetres. He's also strong in the air and can kick on both feet. Once he lands in Adelaide, it'll provide the opportunity to understand more about our club, our philosophies and what our programme looks like. The Crows already have a Gaelic convert, convert at Westlake's AFLW rookie Ailish Considine won a Premiership medal in her debut season with Adelaide's women's team in 2019. So there had been an assumption that he was going to be going to the Brisbane Lions because there was um, another former Tyrone minor there. But it turns out he's headed to Adelaide for this trial anyway. So it's no, no deal has been done, but there will be a two-week training session in January for Colin McShane. And it's the worst thing that happened out of all this is that he gets a holiday for two weeks and two weeks of living like a professional in um, Australia, you know. How bad is that? Like, how bad is that is right? And maybe Mickey Hart will be saying, well, I need everybody in here for pre-season and everybody needs to be around and all that, but good luck to him. Let him go. Let him go spread his wings. Let him find out for himself. I, I boobed. Uh, Conor McKenna is at Essendon, not Brisbane. It's uh, James Madden who's at... Um, Br Brisbane, the Brisbane Lions. Right, 8.08 this morning here. You're watching OTBM, the Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Plenty coming up this hour. Going to be racing the GA Club Finals and rugby uh, with Alan Quinlan before 9 o'clock. Up next, it's football with Keith Andrews. If you want to get involved this morning, you can uh, uh, tweet using the hashtag OTBM or just leave a comment on whatever stream you're watching. We'll be back after this. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the Ball 2019 Imro Radio Awards Sports Programme of the Year. Salah takes the shot. Oh! Oh, Paul Salah with one of the goals of the season. Who will see their dreams turn into reality? Whose names will be etched in history forever? Offtheball.com, best online publisher at the 2019 Spider Awards.
A big breaking story on offtheball.com for you this morning. We have the very latest on the Mayo leaks. We now know what went on in that secretive Mayo County board meeting. 2019 Irish Sponsorship Awards Best Radio Sponsorship OTB Super Value GAA Roadshows. Well, when she comes back, get your arse back here, he said. Star is out sitting on the swing and Darren O'Sullivan is pushing him. <laughs> <laughs> OTB Sports Radio, live online 24-7 on the Go Loud app. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Sport Ireland campus Blanchardstown is the home of Irish sport, not just for our athletes, but for you and the community. For families, check out our kids' camps, sport academies and birthday parties. For adults, why not join our newly refurbished gym with a 50-metre swimming pool or book one of our world-class indoor or outdoor facilities, including our athletics track, sports pitches and courts. And for companies, check out our team building days, conference facilities and events. All this and more at sportirelandcampus.ie. OCB AM. I was saying there, he looks he looks ready for it physically, and he's he's 19 next month, so he's getting he's obviously like um, just getting a little bit older, 19 years of age. But to score, I mean, Pr Preston are playing at a at a decent level in the championship, and uh, he's just he's frightened pace. Yeah. He's you you would think as 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 a if you're the coach of Norwich, you're probably thinking this is a player that we could definitely use to come off the bench with 10 minutes to go because. Um, but I, I I was saying to Dan when when he played in Toulon, and I'd watched him, and I said I I don't really rail at him. Either. He's not. He's not holding up the ball. Um, he's not the outlet that Ireland need. Albeit against very good players. And Dan was saying, "Well, he's 18 years of age. You're obviously writing him off far too early." So anyway, kept watching him for the next four or five so you're games. You're wrong, basically. Oh, couldn't have been more wrong. Um, watch <laughs> him against Sweden. Watch him against in the Italy game. And as Stephen Kenny pointed out during the week when he was playing against Italy, he was playing against a player who'd actually played in Serie A for uh, Inter Milan against Juventus. Came off the bench for half an hour, I think, the week before and played very well. But his performance against Sweden at home was absolutely outstanding and uh, again you know it's I, as much as we're talking about off the pitch I, I think it, we, we've so many reasons four Premier League players including Ida teenagers strikers this year from Ireland and um, that's probably never happened before and yeah it's pretty exciting isn't it Here's it's exciting. Good, I mean come on boop, boop. the hype train is leaving let's go let's get on board there, there seems to be kind of like a bit of a tussle to the front of the queue. Which Irish youngster should we be most excited about? The mantle seems to have gone from Troy Parrott to Aaron Connolly now. Oh, oh Femi started first, right? He no, was sorry, the one. Femi, of course, yeah. before all, all three of them. And you'd kind of forget that they're all in the same age bracket. And then Obafemi gets a Premier League goal recently, and he was kind of front of the hype train. But as long as we've got, as long as we've got four of them, we should win a World Cup. Exactly. I mean, no, uh, no lower Cup expectations than that. Uh, four, two, None four. Of this third, fourth place playoff bollocks. Absolutely, screw that. Four two four is going to be our, our new formation under Stephen Kenny. Um, there's a great piece on the Athletic by uh, Michael Bailey, who does a lot of their Norwich um, work uh, in the wake of his hat trick on Saturday. Because if he's a bit of an unknown quantity to a lot of Irish people, he's certainly a lot of uh, a huge unknown quantity to a lot of people in the UK, I'd imagine. So uh, lunch with Delia, working with Pookie, getting rid of a lazy streak. How Norwich rude and improved. Hat trick hero Ida, and I mentioned um, Robert Flanagan near the top of the show. So he's Norwich's former Ireland-based talent scout. So he'd been watching Ida for a long time. And he was watching the opening game for Cork's representative team in the 2015 Kennedy Cup Summer Youth Tournament. Which, when you see that down in writing and a website like The Athletic, you kind of think to yourself, if Adam Ida goes on to have this hugely successful career, what it does for the prestige of tournaments around Ireland, and namely the Kennedy Cup, the most prestigious one. Like He says that, uh, like you can see the word lazy in the headline, he kind of laughs about that Flanagan. He says that he put down that he was lazy, he lacked movement, but there was something there. And... Um, he said it was one of those instinct things that Ida played when the ball was around him. He didn't work hard, but he didn't necessarily need to work hard. He was just this kid who stuck out because he was outrageously talented, had everything skills-wise. He had it from the physique, um, but he just needed to put in a bit more of the work rate. It's interesting as well when you think about like, the different clubs that were in for him. Like Newcastle were in for him at the time, um, but apparently there was just a general thought around Ida was that Newcastle were a bit of a basket case, somewhere quiet for him to actually learn and develop that had a bit of a better reputation, lying in the championship perhaps a, a bit longer than, than Newcastle uh, or than Norwich wouldn't have um, done him any harm either. Um, like always a top destination for, for a, a kid like Ida to go to Norwich rather than Newcastle because you don't know where the first team opportunities are going to come from because of a, a good bit of turbulence at the club. You saw in the headline there as well, lunch with Delia. So this was to do with 
his mother, Fiona. So she made a, a trip across to Norwich with Adam uh, from her council house home, they say, in the Athletic uh, in the Cork City suburb of Douglas to have a look around. The club soon found out she was a big fan of Delia Smith, but Norwich's joint majority shareholders happened to be at Colony, the training ground, at the same time as Ida's mom. Norwich made sure the two parties met, had lunch, shared a photo, and left Ida's family convinced that they should join the club. So that's what <laughs> they did. Lunch with Delia Smith. Let's be having you. Um, so I don't know if everybody's seen the hat-trick yet. If you haven't, go and uh, go and have a look at it. The first one is just um, a beautiful burst of pace with mm. a sleek right foot shot a minute into the game. Um, now, there's a miscommunication. The defender is like, as Adam Ida is scoring the goal, the defender is like waving at the goalkeeper to come out to it. So like, it's a little bit late. You're, uh, you're trying to rearrange that. But it's, you know, it's just a burst to get past the defender. And uh, it's... it's, it's calm right foot finish a minute into a game mm. in the FA Cup the second one uh, the keeper kicks the ball out um, again a bit of a keeper error but he's about 40 yards out and it's a beautiful left foot shot this time that he just curls into the empty net so you're like okay this guy has composure and the third one is a penalty you're like okay granted it's a penalty but actually it's a penalty he wins himself where he's dribbling around the keeper and the keeper takes him down so the keeper didn't have a great game and you know uh, but uh, this doesn't look like your stereotypical Irish teenager He's like, he's got pace, he's got power, he's big. This is, um, this is the way of the future, and I, for one, welcome our new overlord, Alameda. I 100% agree. The, the most impressive thing, not the most impressive thing, but one of the most impressive things about the second goal was the way the goalkeeper just lashes the ball at Ida. Yeah. Like for him to have that uh, presence of mind to control the ball really quickly and then lash it into the back of the net was really impressive. Just one last line from this article now. I don't want to ever have to get into a situation where we're comparing these players. I want to enjoy them all at the same time. But I couldn't help thinking that way when there is another quote from Flanagan here, the other scout from Norwich. He says, I think seeing Aaron Connolly and Troy Parrott making waves and getting into first teams, it was the realisation for Adam that he's better than some of these players and his time would come. Now, he's not saying for sure that he's better than them, but perhaps he wasn't putting in the work rate that they had mentioned earlier on and he'd seen the likes of Connolly and Parrott come through. Who's saying this? This is Robert Flanagan, Norwich's former Ireland-based okay, scout. Okay. The guy who spotted him at the Kennedy Cup. Right, that's why, that's why the Irish comparison comes in. Mm. Yeah. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? It's hugely exciting. Like you, it's it's hard to think of a time, certainly in the in the last twenty years, when you have four attacking prospects all come along in the space of eighteen months, as has been the case here. And we're all... basically back to Duff and that group coming through, and then Robbie Keane's team coming through yeah. immediately afterwards. That's about, that's about late nineties, so it's it's over twenty years at this yeah. point. Um, just to hammer home the fact that the late 90s is indeed over 20 years ago. Uh, so like th this is, for me, the most exciting one. And I, I will accept that it is more exciting because they're attacking players and they're getting headlines because they're scoring goals in the FA Cup. Whereas perhaps lower down the rung you have a, a performance from Dara O'Shea at West Brom uh, at the weekend who will get into with Keith Andrews as well at the moment. And you, you just see this quote from uh, Slavin Bilic, who's obviously West Brom manager at the moment, about Dara O'Shea. I love Dara O'Shea. We all love him, but forget about how nice he is as a kid. I love Dara as a football player. In the summer, we lost three players in that central back position. So Craig Dawson, Mason Holgate, and at our EBIO, uh, Tosin is his first name, plus Sagazi had surgery. We only brought in one. The club wanted to bring in more. The only reason we didn't was Dara. So you're see seeing these things come through, and like we're, we're used to an element of this down through the years of seeing a manager taking uh, kind of a, a fondness of a certain Irish player. We don't often have four goal scorers no. coming through a time. No, and it would be clubs. one. It would be one player every be three one. or four years, <laughs> like, and that would be it. Um, right, Keith Andrews is with us. Keith, happy New Year to you. Good morning to you. Morning, James. How are we? Yeah, good. Um, no better man than you to talk to. Obviously, very familiar with uh, these lads coming through at underage level. Let's talk about Adam <coughs> first. <coughs> were Were you in any way surprised by the breakthrough that he had at the weekend, or have you kind of seen this coming for a while? <coughs> Yeah, I've known Adam for for a good few years. Obviously, been involved in the underage setups. He would have won, would have been one that would have played up a year. Um, his his size, obviously, physical presence always helps with that. But every single step he's taken in his career, whether it be under 17s when he was in under 16s or in the 21s last year, or having only been 18 years of age when he when he makes his debut, he's taken the steps with with relative ease. I would say. Um, but he's had to be patient this year in particular at Norwich because he could have got plenty of long moves, but they wanted to keep him close to the to the first team. And in the last 
week or so, get this Premier League debut, and, and obviously, well and truly on everyone's radar after his, his hat trick in the in the FA Cup against it, a proper team and impressed and going away. He's uh, he's well and truly on everyone's radar now. He's done very very well. The, the manager afterwards said he's not going to go on loan. Apparently, Doncaster were in and uh, they were close to a deal being done. In some ways. You know, you wouldn't mind seeing somebody like that go out on loan and just play football for the next four or five months for the rest of the season. Because at, at Norwich, like, it's a Premier League team. His minutes will automatically be fewer than they would be if he was to go out on loan. Yeah, Jerry, I think, think the issue you have with, with these young players is that it's brilliant that they do well and the respective club managers think highly of them. But you can, you can ironically be too close to a first team and that and that is actually detrimental to your development because you don't get enough minutes and, and even when you're that close and you're on the bench you don't even play 23 as football at times so your general fitness isn't isn't quite up to speed so yeah you're right they look I think the Doncaster ones I would imagine dead and buried now I spoke to Doncaster system manager last week and he was of the uh, assumption that it was kind of done and dusted but I'd be very surprised if that if that happens now after his exploits at the weekend against Preston. Yeah, because, like, is he ready to play 15 minutes at the end of a Premier League match? Well, after getting a hat-trick against a good championship team at the weekend, you, you'd have to say yes. You know, he's, he's playing understudied the team of Puki, who's, who's got a bit of a knock at the moment. All along this season, he's kind of been third choice striker of the first team. He's trained with the first team all season. Um, they only play with one striker. It's the way they play, and Pukki's obviously their number one striker. So it'll be interesting to see how that develops over over the coming weeks. But you can only imagine what he's feeling at the moment, the confidence to be through the roof, the confidence that other players will have in him now. They'll, they'll have seen it in training. Um, Daniel Farke has said earlier in the season, the game against Crawley in the league could not quite hit the heights, but He's, uh, he's certainly done that on Saturday against Preston. It's been mentioned in a couple of the articles, Keith, about how Adam obviously was earmarked from a very young age as having a great physique and just a great technical player. But his work rate was something that had to be worked on. Is that something that you'd agree with that you've seen over the last couple of years? Yeah, well, I, I feel like I've, I've built up a decent relationship with Adam because I've worked with him for a few years and I, I think there's an element of trust there. So I can be very frank and honest with it with Adam about his game and there's certain aspects like every single young player that, that you have to work on. Um, the goal scoring <clears throat> instinct I think has always been there and it's probably unusual for a player of that size to have that. You normally think of a, a fox in the box type predatory striker and he's not that because of his physique but he's got a very good clinical edge to his game but general parts of his game, general hold up play, types of runs that he makes how to affect the opposition out of possession. All these types of aspects of the game are areas that, that he that he needs to work on. Um, but I think as long as he's focused, as long as he keeps that focus, those areas will come. He, he has the area where you know a lot of strikers crave for, and that's in front of goal, the different types of finishes that he that he can produce. He he, he has that in the locker already. He's six foot three, so he's a big lad. Yeah, he's a unit, yeah. He's an absolute unit, and when he uses that uh, to his benefit, and when he really gets into that mode of I'm, I'm, I'm on it today, and I'm going to show the opposition centre half that I'm in business. And you only need to look at a few of the games that we've played with the 21 against top, top opposition. We played Brazil in the Toulon tournament, and they had two centre halves that are worth gazillions. Gave them a really tough time against Italy and Salah. You've got players that are playing for Inter Milan, for Stoney, centre-half, and he, he made him look very, very ordinary. And, and they're all aspects out of possession and running him behind and, 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 and threatening him behind and showing that pace and utilising that pace and power. Because when you have those attributes and you, and you don't use them, then they, they're obviously not going to be very, very effective. So I think it's just bringing all parts of his game together. And I think he's at a football club that, that work hard at that in terms of trying to develop him as, a, as an individual within that team structure, obviously. Yeah, we were we were chatting there before you came on air just about how long it's been since we had four players uh, at that age group who are breaking through at the same time, who are all attacking players. So there's himself, there's Conley, there's Parrott and there's 
Obafemi at the moment. It's unbelievably exciting. It must be exciting for you guys to be involved with at that level as well to kind of to see the different rates of progression that they're all going through at the moment. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? Like we've, look, we've had, we've had a good year in terms of them playing, them scoring goals them producing some brilliant performances, all of them. Um, but then there's big chunks, isn't there, in between international camps. And international teams can only do so much for for individual players. You give them a little bit of a platform, even when at club level maybe it's not going as well or they've had an injury or they've had a dip in form. It, 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 I think it's nice because I've had it as a player and I, I know how much I cherished it when you came back into the international fold and you had that belief in you. Um, you, you can go again. But between November and March, it's a huge chunk of time. And, and then it's very much down to what they do at, at club level. But it's, it's also an exciting time because we've seen it. But they have got first-team action. So we need them to develop that first-team action. And whether that's going to be at their respective clubs or potentially in January going and, going and getting a long move to, to further develop and kick on again to the next level. I, I, look, it's just, it's just exciting overall as long as they keep developing in, in the way that we think they can. Were you, were you surprised that Troy Parrott didn't get on yesterday, Keith? And like, I mean, there was some suggestion that the, when Jose came in, the, the loose kind of notion that perhaps he doesn't give young players a chance, and then you see him uh, getting the, the Premier League match ball a couple of weeks back, and there's talks of a new contract. Then this morning, it's kind of hard to know exactly where he lies, but perhaps it just comes with the youth and uh, inexperience at this point to not be thrown in when Spurs needed a goal yesterday. Yeah, look, it's one of those where. They obviously feel the right path for Troy is using him at the right time. A little bit like Adam having him around the training set up every single day to get used to that type of intensity of training. And, and you have to remember how young Troy and in particular is. Um, and, and it may well be that you know he's used in that way where he gets a few minutes here and there. Or if they see fit at a certain stage, he can play a few games. But then maybe next season, that that. They have earmarked from to, to go on loan, and again, I, I'm just thinking out loud. But is it disappointing from our perspective? Yes, I suppose to a degree. But also, we have to be be patient with them because they are they are very young at the same time. Dar O'Shea was uh, a name that kind of went under the radar at the weekend. I think everybody would go under the radar when you've got uh, an Irish youngster scoring a hat-trick. But uh, he's had an interesting time so far at West Brom. I just didn't realise how much Slavin Bilic loves him. He's a huge Dar O'Shea fan. Yeah, I spoke to I spoke to Slavin Bilic at the first game of the season. I covered the first game. It was that Nottingham Forest. And I spoke to him that day. Uh, and he said that day how much did he, he, he rated Star O'Shea. And I think he was speaking about before I came on about the reason why they did bring in another centre-half. And this goes back to what I was saying about being so close to a first team. And, I, and I've been in that position myself in my early 20s where we were playing 4-4-2 we had really good central midfielders Paul Ince Alex Ray Colin Cameron I was always part of it but I, I didn't develop in the, in, the, in the space of a year 18 months and, and, I, and I actually declined as a player because I just wasn't playing enough minutes at first team level now that O'Shea is, is so close to that first team and he's so highly thought of by Slavin Bilic and the football club it's a delicate one for him because they're in a, such a good position in the league you can understand the predicament that Slavin Bilic is in that if anything happens to Hagazi or Ad, or, or uh, Ajoy at centre half, he, he'll go straight in. He, he's, he's shown that he's proved that he, he will do that. Um, but he's he's one of the most improved players that we have over the last year, eighteen months after his loan spell at, at Exeter, where he was outstanding and he got it got him used to to playing competitive football. And, and I think it got him into a mindset of away from eighteen to twenty three is football that. Yeah, this is this is way this is the way I need to train. This is the way I need to prepare to be a, a proper professional. So I've got a lot of admiration for Derek. Yeah, the uh, the future is feeling pretty bright at the moment with uh, that crop of players coming through. Um, before I let you go here, Keith, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, Arsenal playing Leeds tonight in the FA Cup as well. Bielsa obviously is saying that his main uh, thrust of the entire season is to get that team promoted and so this isn't that big a game for him but that he wants these games uh, to be part of Leeds' future. What do you think is going to happen tonight and what do you make of how Leeds are going at the moment? Yeah, Leeds are, Leeds are doing well. They they've, haven't played brilliantly over the last month, I would suggest. Um, but when that happened last year, they, you know, unless they were dominating games and taking chances, it, it cost and That's what ended up costing. They ran out of a little bit of steam. The issue, the issue this time around is 
they just lost two very, very talented players. Eddie and Ketty has gone back to Arsenal. And there's a little bit of frustration, I think, from from, from Leeds fans that, that he has gone back because they are a little bit light in that department now, only having a Patrick Bamford, really. Um, and Jack Clark, who, who they sold the scores, got long back. He, he was an outstanding player for them at times last year. He had a bit of an illness and an injury. Uh, so they need to fill those voids. Um, look, they've built up a nice little lead themselves in West Brom at, at the top of the table. And I, and I think they'll see it off this year. I think they'll have enough as long as they maybe replace those two players. And, and those players that have been with Bielsa now for the space of 18 months or so, they still play a very, very high-energy, high-pressing game. And it's, and it's brilliant to watch. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how many changes but they make tonight for the, for the game against Paris. We've seen the amount of changes over the weekend. It's quite sad in a way. But equally, I, I can't particularly blame club managers with the hectic schedule over Christmas because it's uh, been relentless. Yeah, no, absolutely. Keith, great stuff. Thanks a million for joining us this morning. Cheers. Cheers, lads. Take care. It's Keith Andrews. Happy New Year to you. And uh, giving us some thoughts on that. 8.30 this morning here on OTBAM. Um, it's hard not to get too carried away. People giving us grief for that. Uh, Connor Joyce. Are we actually comparing these young players who are good to Damien Duff and Robbie Keane? Yes, it's great to see young Irish goal scorers, but seriously, calm down and wait until they have a consistent run in their teams before hiring them as Ireland saviours. We're talking about excitement rather than actual... Talent. Nobody compared them to Duff and uh, Robbie Keane. Steady on, Connor. We said that there has been no time since um, uh, Duff and Keane that we've had as many players coming through who were attacking players. Attacking We've got players. to go back to the, the underage Brian Kerr era. It was the last time that we had players who were this interesting coming through mm. as, uh, as attackers. Yeah, congratulations to the FAI. Thank you for uh, producing these four players. Look, you know, I mean, there's obviously loads of people doing great work at, uh, well, in at fairness, coaching level. That is true. The, and all the <coughs> regional development officers and all those people who are, you know, unheralded. Um, and look, maybe all those plans that uh, Rude Doctor have had have finally come to fruition. Um, will the IRFU step in and provide temporary relief cover for Connacht's 19 player injury crisis like it did for Munster and Ulster in the recent past asks Dar O'Toole uh, that's pretty interesting uh, Ms Star on YouTube says the poor LGA can't deal with a bit of competition but it can the thing is like it, it totally can this is just one manager giving out about it mm. like loads of loads of counties have lost players Mayo Kildare Kerry have lost uh, Stephen O'Cumber and a couple of others uh, yeah um, so well, there's talks so, uh, currently about the goalkeeper Devidus Iosis, but he played for Kerry yesterday in, in tipping the McGrath up. But of course, Cork have lost Adam Ida to, to soccer. Dublin have lost Darrow O'Shea to soccer. Was he a good Gaelic footballer? A uh, good Gaelic footballer as well. There's actually uh, on Darrow O'Shea. I'm not, like I know we've got to move on. Just like he is, there's another piece uh, about Darrow O'Shea in the Athletic today as well. Um, the, and Alan Caffrey who uh, spent time with him as, as head coach at St. Kevin's. Because he was excellent at GEA, Dublin the most successful county, and always there to offer him to change codes, but he wanted to be a professional footballer, and then talks about how you've got to be brave in Gaelic football and all that, speaking to a UK market. But we know that. We yeah. know that GEA made him. Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, Curtis Jones, obviously the best story of the weekend, says uh, Sam Lowther, who I think is just a Liverpool fan. Uh, right, sports news and racing next with Tom Malone. First, though, down club Kilku made it through to the AIB Senior Club Football All-Ireland Final after beating Dublin Giants Bally Bowden St. Enders. After the game, Ashing O'Reilly caught up with their star forward, Jerome Johnson. Um, probably take a wee bit of time to sink in, it'll probably be home. But uh, I'd say, uh, I'd say my dad's waiting on me to say a few things to me about some of them shots that I took today. Jeez, I heard you there. You were like, why didn't I go near post? I'm like, you're in the All-Ireland final. Do you really care? <laughs> it'll not be probably forgiven in our house until it's all over. Um, <laughs> just the way it is. That'll be the whole focus of the next two weeks. What were you doing? What were you doing? Mm -hmm. So, but look, back to work. Uh, Monday or Tuesday night and, you know, Cora Finn are going for three in a row. Yeah. So it's going to be a mighty, mighty task. But I'm sure you would have thought like that coming out here today against Valley Bowden. You know, they've, they've been there before. They won it in 2016. They had that experience. So, you know, you didn't have the fear out there today. It didn't look like it anyway. Oh, no, look, we know of a good squad of players there. Um, if you've seen some of our training games, they go right to the wire sometimes, actually. Well, the so-called... Uh, second team should I say actually beat the A team so there is a lot of strength and depth in the squad and uh, it only leads us to, to, to a better place and what about playing in front with your brother what's that like two of them uh, <laughs> yeah two, two uh, today yeah, yeah was that a first for a while for the three years to be starting 
Hey, uh, Aquil, we both played uh, the Ulster final again, yeah, mm. but it was probably touch and go to see whether Shane would play or not because yeah. he hasn't done much there this last five weeks. But uh, him and the youngest in the house, uh, he actually led the way towards the end up front. So I know, yeah, brilliant. He got the last points, wasn't he? Did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So look, all those things are positive, and as I said, leads for a bit of stick in the house now. I, on the receiving end of it tonight, so. Yeah. <laughs> and so what'll happen now for the next about two weeks you have, isn't it, until the final? Well, I think Monday yeah, we'll be back to work, so that'll be, just, that'll be the first thing. Uh, and then, look, it'll just be back to business. Uh, Mickey probably takes down to earth, uh, <laughs> say Tuesday night, could be tough. And then that'll settle everything down again and go again. Yeah, so an all-out final for them to look forward to, obviously against a, a brilliant team like Curfin, you would give them a good chance, but Curfin will be raging hot favourites for that one. You would have thought so, uh, like basing it purely on what we've seen over the last couple of years, you might have thought that Nemo would have been Curfin's biggest test, but that's hugely unfair on Kilku given the performance they put in at the weekend. And Curfin just come with so much pedigree that Kilku could possibly win any other all Ireland prior to the last two two or three years and this Curfin team have just gone to another level. If they can stamp themselves as the best club team of all time with three in a row, no other team has done it. So there's a huge incentive there for Curfin. Yeah, let's hear from Curfin now. Here's the Curfin goalkeeper, uh, Bernard Power, speaking with more trust and Kelly after they beat Nemo on Saturday as well. Have a look. Bernie Power, um, that was um, a game where you didn't have to work too hard, but when you did, you really had to work. Yeah, I, I personally think we did have to work hard. We knew getting the first goal to start was a, was a massive plus for us because our aim going into that game was to concede no goals. And uh, thankfully we did that, but de- definitely Nemo definitely putting it up to us. And going in this, at half time, we knew it was going to be a game in the second half, and it definitely was. I don't know if the scoreline was as tight as how they, were, they played us. I hope you don't mind me saying this as a Galwegian. We often watch you, and we're like, it's great fun watching you, but you can kind of give us heart attacks too. Even right there at the end, but you somehow managed to get the little shoulder off. You flung the, the Nemo attacker three feet away from you, and you got a massive cheer. Ah, uh, yeah, that's at the end of the game. Now all the bodies out the, out the park are tired. I'm standing the goals for most of the game, so it's not too bad when you're fresh rolling out at the tired legs. So. Yeah, because when you'd be watching from goals at times, I'm sure it must be quite frustrating. You're seeing things happening, but also everything kind of starts and ends with you. Yeah, it does, yeah. It starts with the kickouts, I suppose, and it ends with the shots stopping, but all the boys out the middle of the park and the field and everything, top class from today now, and hopefully we can push on for two weeks' time because there's still a lot of work to be done. I was just going to say, yeah, there's no big break this year. No, no, hopefully hopefully now we can push on because we still have a bit of work and a bit of, bit of stuff to work on whoever wins the next game, so looking forward to watching that now. Is that better or worse without the break? Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to tell. I'll, t- I'll tell you after the next game, really. So. <laughs> well, that's it. we still don't know yet who's yeah. going to be in that next game with you. But watching here at Curfin, the performance was amazing. It was wa- William watching you play his like a little orchestra. Everything went fine until in front of the post. Not your post, you'd be glad yeah. to hear. But I'm sure that's something you guys will be working on. What happened there, do you think? Yeah, we just have to sharpen up on our shooting, really. It's, uh, it's great that you're getting the opportunities. Once you get the opportunities, they- they'll come on the-, on the right day, hopefully. And uh, the pitch out there is absolutely perfect. It's-, it's great playing on a pitch like that this time of the year. All right, let's move on. It's 8.37 a.m. this morning. You're listening to OTB AM. Tom Malone is here. Tom, good morning to you. How's it going? Very well. Uh, yeah, good. Good weekend. Uh, good weekend for horse racing fans as well. Yeah, we well, want to start there. We talk about that first. Yeah, well, we'll start with that because uh, first grade one of the calendar seat of the calendar uh, in Ireland yesterday where NYLN took the Lord of the Nice grade one novice hurdle um, over two and a half miles. It makes him seven out of seven now. Uh, last year's Cheltenham champion bumper winner. He'll have a looking forward to Cheltenham. He'll have he, we won it very well. Um, he'll have what three, four entries at Cheltenham Festival. He's pretty much he's around about eleven to eight, I think, for the Ballymore novices, which is the two and a half mile novice hurdle. It's the most likely race for him. But why would they go for something different? The, that that uh, the well, the temptation would be to go up against the big boys and have a cut at the champion hurdle. Right. Um, and there will be a call for him to do that because this year's champion hurdle looks a substandard renewal. So, um, MYLN, there will be a lot of public talk about him. Going champion, to the champion hurdle is hurdle. for not for it's, novices. No, no, it's for the for the elite. But is this there is more a prize money. Yes, there's there a lot is. more prize money okay, as well. So. But you know, Shively Park paid four hundred thousand euros for this horse, so they're, so not, in it for the they're not not particularly concerned about that. But this guy is a chaser in the making. Um, ultimately, his. His career goal, you would imagine, would be to win a Gold Cup one How day. How do you know he's changed in the making? What, what is the physically on his page, everything about him? He's just he's a gorgeous big stamp of a horse. But 
a lot of these chasers when they when they jump the smaller obstacles look awkward or they can be a little bit slow over them what makes what sets him apart is that uh, he's just really quick over his obstacles okay. and he seems to have genuine pace so he's a really exciting prospect also the day before as well fiddler on the roof for colin tizard won the tallworth which is the first grade one in the uk um and ideally these two horses would clash at cheltenham that would be the ideal team they look in the novices in, hurdle. In that, in that novices hurdle to set up right. a, a proper clash. So that would be an ideal situation. And there's no chance to meet them beforehand. They'll be kept apart. No, no, no. I'd imagine both horses will nearly go straight to Cheltenham at this rate. Okay, right. Um, so what are we, the January? So. Yeah, yeah. You'd imagine the two of them would. would but uh, yeah, two very exciting horses. Two and a half. Uh, I would I would be with Envoy Land, but Fiddler, Fiddler in the Reef looks 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 good. Again, similar kind of profiles as well. They're obviously both sort of chases in the making, but that's just kind of the trend now for the horses that are sort of making money as sort of three-year-olds of the sales and they're going on and becoming pointers they're stoutly bred they're ultimately for that game they're ultimately you know they're, they're exciting as novice hurdlers but most of them then rather than going on to open hurdle classes skip. will skip that and just go into being novice chasers, chasers. so okay. you look at again the last two years novice chasers have looked excellent and that's just a product of the way horses have been bought now because we're always sitting here at cheltenham week and uh, kind of looking at people like yourself or any other racing pundit say and you're kind of uh, glorifying the fact that you all got on anti-post betting. Is, is Envoy Alain going to be one of those horses? 11 to 8, come, he, said. He, he said 11 to 8. He is going to be the... He will it's be... Too late. The, he, no, well, he's done last year. He's he, he he the plunge be, horse. He will be the Irish banker, the one that like... He's got a 6-4 on kind of thing. He, he could easily, yeah, yeah, yeah. Once... The, look, it just once it'll come to... Too rich for my blood on Monday. Really. It'll come to Monday morning and... Um, sorry, Sunday, mo Sunday evening and we'll be like... Tuesday declaration is ready for Cheltenham. Envoy Lane is not clear for the champion hurdle. Steam into him for the Ballymore. And that's all you need to know. Right, what else is going on today? Uh, we'll start with Gaelic Games. Um, Tipperary champions Boris Lee ended a 33-year wait to make it back to the AIB All-Ireland Club Senior Hurling Final yesterday. Uh, Brendan Maher inspired side were seven-point winners over St Thomas of Galway in the semi-final in Limerick. They now take on the might of defending champions Ballyhale Shamrocks of Kilkenny in the final in two weeks' time. And Boris Lee manager Johnny Kelly says his side are well used to being underdogs. Yeah, obviously uh, we will be, and, and, and uh, on the basis that, that Ballyhale Shamrocks are, are All-Ireland champions and the players that they have and, and the youth that they've brought through over the last couple of years has uh, energised Ballyhale, like, and we are very aware of that. Like, if we, if we don't set up properly or if we don't bring our intensity levels up in two weeks' time, then Ballyhale will hurt us and hurt us badly. So if we do, you know, it gives us a chance. Quick word in the Walsh Cup as well, because Dublin remained in the hunt for the Walsh Cup semi-final spot after beating Carlo yesterday by 3.20 to 18 points. Maddie Kenny's side will play their rescheduled clash with Leash on Thursday evening, and then we'll put them through to the last four of that pre-season competition. Uh, in football, it was a wonder goal from Curtis Jones, which meant Liverpool, who started three teenagers yesterday, saw off Everton in the Merseyside derby in the FA Cup third round. David Moyes earned his second win in charge in his second stint uh, at West Ham yesterday when they got the better of Gillingham by two goals to nil to make tonight's fourth round draw. Chelsea comfortably beat Nottingham Forest by two goals to nil at home, while Spurs will need a replay against Middlesbrough after yesterday's 1-0 draw at the Riverside. There's one game tonight. It's a repeat of the 1972 final as Arsenal welcome championship leaders Leeds to the Everts. It the, sounded familiar. Well, at, well I mean, 1-0 <laughs> to Leeds that day. I was looking through this as well. Thierry Henry is the most unbelievable record against Leeds. I think he scored 12 goals against oh, them. I mean, when he considered, even even when he came back, he got one against him in the FA Cup. And that was everything. hilarious. Uh, <laughs> he just yeah, twelve goals. Like he, one day he got four. Uh, just absolute piggery against them. But uh, Mikel Arteta aiming to make it back-to-back -back wins as Arsenal manager, and he says he's a big admirer of his rival head coach uh, Marcelo Bielsa. You talk to players that they had him as a coach. What the words that they have towards him, they are always positive. They, they, they were better players afterwards, better people. They understood the profession better. Our kickoff at the Emirates Stadium tonight at 7:56. Of course, they have that uh, mental health initiative there, delaying all those kickoff times by an hour. Uh, in American football last night, the Minnesota Vikings stunned the New Orleans Saints in the NFL Wild Card rounds last night. A Vikings quarterback, Kirk Cousins, excelled in the 26-20 overtime victory. It sees them through to play the fancied San Francisco 49ers next. The Seattle Seahawks also progressed last night. They beat the Philadelphia Eagles 17-9 to set up a day with Aaron Rodgers and the Green Bay Packers next weekend. And we'll 
we'll close with golf, where Justin Thomas won the Century Tournament of Champions in Hawaii last night in a playoff. The 26 year olds of the challenge of Fennel Countrymen, Patrick Reed and Xander Schofler in a three man third playoff hole. It was the first three man playoff since the winners only PGA Tour event moved to Kapalua in 1999. Uh, Graham McDowell, by the way, finished back in a tie for 23rd on one under par after final round 72. How much do you get for that, winning that? I'm sure it's I'm sure, I'm sure it's not insignificant. Anyway. Patrick Reed obviously taken to heart all the criticism he had over the last month or so. It's really damaging his golf game. It's like, yeah, come on, bring it on. It's like he's a, you know, kind of feeds off the energy. And, and yeah, and like you know, there's there's only what 34 of them. They're sent to Hawaii. Oh, it's <laughs> it's just... in January, early January, when the rest of the world is like, oh, it's pretty miserable. It's like, no, yeah. I'm gonna go off and have a good time, win a million dollars. Yeah, minimum. Right. 8.44, 8.45 here this morning on OTBM. It is Monday, January the 6th. Nulig Naman. Yesterday, and off the ball from 1 to 7 p.m., we had a full day of female voices on the radio and launched a brand new show, Keane and McGean Unleashed, as swimmer Alan Keane and runner Kira McGean were joined by Irish legend Sonia Sullivan and boxer Kelly Harrington. You can listen back to it via podcast or watch the show on YouTube or tune into OTB Sports Radio at 3 o'clock today. Have a quick listen. The amount of success you've had since 2016 has been phenomenal. And just how did you get into boxing? Could you tell us that? Um, well, I, basically, when I was younger, um, I was going down the wrong pathway. I suppose there's two pathways you can go down. One is the right one and one is the wrong one. And I was heading down the wrong one at a, at a very early age. And I suppose I needed, I like, I was very mature, like, um, academically not very smart but streetwise very smart so I knew what I was doing was wrong and I knew I needed to, have to change something so I knew sports was good and I suppose boxing is very well known in the inner city mm. there's a boxing club on every second corner nearly so uh, that was how I ended up getting into boxing and the discipline in boxing is, is like it's the best discipline that you could have really and the coaches they let you away with nothing. When you were yeah. when you were first starting off and you were joining the boxing club, did you ever have dreams of the Olympic Games? To be honest with you, no, I've never had a dream of, of the Olympic Games because I started boxing basically to, to take me on a different journey in my life. And as long as I was on a different journey, that was my, my goal was to was to take me away off that wrong path and onto the right path. And, and it's not only until like 2016 when I actually started to believe in myself that I could actually do something with, with my career, with boxing, that I started to believe in myself. Yeah, so that's great stuff from Alan Keane and Kieran McGean speaking with Kelly Harrington. You can hear that today at three o'clock. It is uh, obviously Nulig Naman today. Um, and uh, you can listen back to our whole uh, series of podcasts on the OTV Podcast Network. Uh, Alan Quillen is here. Happy New Year to you. Same to you, Ger. It's um, pretty good for the Leinster fans, but the Munster fans must be feeling a little bit, hmm, things need to change pretty quickly. Yeah, I think it's uh, obviously, and the game at the weekend was very, very disappointing to say the least. I was, I was pretty optimistic on Friday, um, thinking that uh, they could go and put in a good performance and run, run Ulster close. Ulster only had three changes in, in their side and probably had the you know, the luxury, the way the fixtures fell, they sent a second string stroke, third string academy down to to Leinster, the RDS in the first, the one before Christmas, and then they did two home games where yeah. they walloped Connacht and and, and, um, and beat Munster really well as, uh, in, in, in that last game on Friday. So they probably, the fixtures fell good from that. And, and obviously they had only Henderson and, and Stockdale out of their group. So they've had a bit of consistency in selection, but that doesn't take away from their performance. I think they've they've played a lot of really, really good rugby. Dan McFarlane's done a brilliant job with them. The pace of their game, the accuracy has really, really improved. And um, you know, they're a team that I've we've all probably had a had a cut off in the last couple of seasons, but they're they're doing very, very well. Yeah, they're doing great and um they're good to watch. And uh, part of it is that they have a nine who they trust to be a game maker and to to yeah. to run things through. Yeah, <coughs> and obviously he's played very well for him. He's a really good footballer. There's a real spring and energy in his step. He's quick. He's um, but it, it's probably and it's a strange thing to say because Ulster's set piece hasn't been great. Their line out and their scrum has creaked a bit, and uh, but they're, they're that makes it all the more impressive, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. But I think where he's profiting from is is their their carries are very very dominant. And their efficiency around the breakdown has improved tenfold. I think, um, you know, 
one of the things that we, we spoke about Ulster for a lot in the last couple of years was lack of ball carriers. Mm. They now have a number of carriers who are getting over the gain line. The ball is quick. Cooney bounces in um, and out of the breakdown and, and his delivery is very good. So um, on the flip side of that, Conor Murray is kind of struggling because it's a dogfight a lot of the time to get the ball back. No, that doesn't take away from the fact that he looks a little bit unsettled. He looks a little bit unhappy in himself. Um, I'm not saying he is and that there's something going on, but I just think he's probably a little bit frustrated. And sometimes when you're chasing kind of really good performances. And isn't that the thing? Like some players have uh, World Cup hangovers that are different from everybody else's and like you just have to accept that in, in a way. That, like yeah. I'm not saying you accept a lower standard of play from what we're used to, but like different players respond to different things different well, ways. What no one should accept from Munster anyways is, is, is your pack going to, to Belfast and being... Um, bullied, bullied around the field and I think it's very hard for Conor Murray to play well behind that and I think a lot of the games, you know, they're getting parity maybe, some games they're, they're probably losing the battle and still doing, doing okay in other games but there's no dominance there from his pack in front of him and it's very difficult for him to play well then and get his confidence because it's a bit of a battle all the time so um, when you're kind of struggling a little bit with form you kind of rely on as a scrum half on, on, on the front, the guys in front of you to deliver good ball so that you can try and make a few line breaks, that you can kind of run with the ball. He hasn't really had any opportunities to make a line break. His defensive cover, um, his work rate is, is very, very, very good still, but I just think it's that bit of zip and getting the ball away and, and making some breaks. The harsh, the harsh question that Andy Farrell will be asking himself is, if you put John Cooney into Conor Murray's shoes on Friday night, would he have done a better job than Conor Murray did? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I don't know. Um, it's 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 uh, probably because I think he's probably full of confidence at the moment. He believes he can do anything. Um, he's kicking goals. He's in touchline clearances. He's making line breaks. I think he's anticipation and. Uh, when somebody makes a break, that was kind of an upfield run that he made for that try where they, they got a little bit of space in the outside. So it's like a striker in soccer on, I think, when you're mm. sometimes you, you don't have to do a lot and you just make a little break and the ball falls to your feet and stuff. And that's happening at the moment. And Conor Murray's had that year in 2018 where, you know, lots of things stick for him and it's just not happening at the moment. So he's got to stick in there. He's a very, very strong character. And I played with him towards the end of my career. And we always looked in awe at this young guy coming through because he was an incredible athlete. Um, and he's just suffered a little bit. I think he's, he's taken a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of kind of disappointing results in the last 12 months with Munster and, and with Ireland. So Do you just play through that? Do you take some time off? Do you give him well, a... It's up to Andy, Andy Farrell now. I think that if, you, if you're going to pick on form, you know, it's probably John Cooney deserves a shot. Um, you know, you can, as a coach, you can go and pick someone who's, you can pick Connor and he could be brilliant against Scotland and Wales and start. But that's the kind of risk that yeah. that we spoke about that Joe, Joe took with a lot of the Irish players we, heading to the World Cup. So I don't think we're, I think we need to change that yes. mentality a little bit now and throw a little bit of caution to the wind. And I think you can put Connor Murray on the bench and bring him off and that could re, re, reinvigorate him or uh, re-energise him if, if you like. But that's not to say that he won't start. He could, Conor Murray could easily start and be, and be really good for Ireland. But I think if you're, if you're going to reward form, I think John Cooney is the one that, that um, deserves a shot at it. Johan van Graan wasn't a happy man after the game on, on Friday. No. It's probably a combination of things, obviously the performance they put in in Belfast, but also, I guess, the, the load management from the RFU. Munster have been hit relatively hard by that, harder than, say, a team like Ulster would have been over the festive period. It's not really something he can have too many concerns with because he knew what he was getting into when he takes the Munster job. Yeah, and it's probably a little bit of... Um, they have been hit hard. Um, it's probably the depth as well of the the next level coming through. I think you could talk about Leinster and their depth, and we speak about that all the time. The, um, Leo Cullen's in a very, very good position that way with a lot of a lot of his players um, are, that are coming through. But um, there is some good young players coming through at Munster. Um, Gavin Coombs came on the other night. He's a very good prospect. Jack O'Sullivan, um, Shane Daly at fullback. So there's a couple of guys you can name, but it's very difficult then when the whole team is under pressure and and 
You know, it doesn't matter who you have in the back line, in my opinion, if your forwards are getting beaten. It's Why are the forwards getting beaten? Because they're not, they're not, some of them are not good enough. Um, and that's the harsh reality of it. Um, some of them are underperforming. Um, some of them are out of form. Um, and it just takes one or two, Jerry, in a t any team or three to make a couple of mistakes, just be a little bit off. And that kind of snowballs and it makes it more difficult. And then you're playing away from home, you're playing a crowd, baying for blood, a team full of confidence. So little things, because they started the game well, Munster, to be fair to them. And I just thought, you know, they just didn't impose themselves. They didn't have any ball carriers. They didn't make hard yards. They didn't win the collisions. And, you know, I think I heard people, some people talking about desire. And it, there is a desire part to it as well, but there's just a bit of pride in it as well. That, you know, look, a few things went wrong on them and a but couple of mistakes. desire and pride are going to be all, all well and good. If you've no ball carriers, if you don't have the right players... Well, they can, just didn't, can... they didn't carry the ball the other night. You know, there's some of them well able to carry the ball. And, and, and they were a little bit naive in the way they tried to, to play the game. Ulster just fanned out um, and just smashed them and, and were up for the fight a little bit more, which is very disappointing. And I've always said this. My biggest criticism of Munster, any Munster team over the years, is if you're not up for the fight when you put on that jersey, it's a problem. It's a problem for me, and it's a problem for anyone who's ever worn the jersey. And like I said, I was never, I'm not sitting here saying I was perfect in any of my performances. I often needed to kick up the backside myself. But, you know, there is a responsibility, and that, that message has to keep kind of going. And you talk about standards week after week. Um, I think that fight just wasn't strong enough the other night. And look, there is a little bit of quality issue there at times when, when you go down the, the levels. So it wasn't missing against Leinster, though. It was just a little no, bit of fairness, brain power yeah, at the end. It's a little, uh, but it's a confidence thing, Ger. So if they get a result against Leinster, you know, you get a surge of confidence there. If they got a draw against Leinster, I think yeah, that would you can take something out of it. And, and look, there's small margins in that game. You look back at the video, there's a couple of things that just went against them and it's probably down to their own application, losing the ball, turning it over, just being a bit passive. Um, in, guys getting, in the Ulster game? Yeah, the, guys yeah. getting isolated, discipline was poor. They're just making it difficult for themselves and can that's they, the stuff they look back at. Can they fix it for a trip to Paris to play? It, look, it's very difficult because they're, they're on a run of two, two wins and seven. There's one draw and they're in four losses. Um, so confidence is a big thing and it's it's the energy that it can kind of create and you can bounce off each other. Um, there's still a lot of character there and there's a lot of a lot of pride in 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 in, in guys who, who want to play and want to go. Their season is on the line effectively. They go to Racing against a side who were fantastic in Thoman Park and their star studded side with with a lot of top quality internationals. So it's gonna be very, very difficult. But it's probably not the most daunting place in France you can go to. Um, but I think, you know, Racing won't underestimate Munster because they are very wounded now. That one will really sting on Friday night, you know. If you if you go up there and you lose by 10, 12 points and you, you're in the fight and you're you're battering away at the line and you make a couple of mistakes, you can live with that. But I just think it was mid-second yeah. half, it was over and it was, it was uh, you know, right after half time, it was Munster needed to come out and set set the tempo, and and the opposite happened. You know, they just retreated and um, played really, really poorly. They'll know that themselves, but they need to be an awful lot better because, you know, I think it would be, it would be a a real blow if they didn't get. We know before the start of the tournament, it was a, it was a really hard group with Saracens and Racing, but. They look back with a lot of regret on that draw in Limerick. Um, maybe not getting the losing bonus point in Saracens when they had the kick. Yeah. And, you know, they they can't have any regrets this weekend. They really need to throw caution to the win. And they need to speed up the way they play. In one sense, Stephen Larkham is trying to get a bit of width in their game. But then sometimes they retreat back into slow it down. When the pressure comes on, they retreat to box kick, slow it down, one out runners. They need to bring tempo and pace to their game against in, 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 in Paris on Sunday or else they, they have no chance. Is that part of the game plan, do you think, the retreating into a, a slower game well, look, plan? Look, I, I think they, they want to try and play and I think, <coughs> um, I do believe Johan van Graan and, and, and Stephen Larkham and they are trying to change and, 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 and play with it. But it's down to personnel as well sometimes, Owen. Um, but they do retreat back into what, where they were under Rassi when, in fairness, he had such an effective 
kind of 12 months when they made the European semi-final, Pro 14 final um, in the 2016-17 season. And they kind of retreat back to that. That can only get you so far. Rassi Erasmus played like that with South Africa because he has beasts on the field and monsters to come off the bench. Um, but you've got to play more rugby and they don't have that physical imposing. Now, I know Stander will come back and make a massive difference. Klein will. Kilcoyne hasn't a lot of rugby played. He will, you know, start. Um, but I think a lot of their other frontline players really need to step up and take a little bit of ownership this week because, you know, if, if they go to Paris and make silly errors and get bullied, uh, and when I say bullied, I mean you're losing the 50-50 collisions. Yeah. You, that's going to happen sometimes. It, it's rugby. You run out of your opposite number. He knocks you back. The next time, you've got to make sure you react. But they're losing too many of these collisions. Um, so they've got to real, bring a real anger and, and, and accuracy around their, their ball work. And then Conor Murray has a better chance of playing well. And Carberry, get him the ball quick. Get the ball into Carberry's hands as quick as you can. Because he is someone who can make something happen. Get it to Chris Farrell, get it to Earls Conway. These are the guys you want to have running in a 4G pitch in Paris on Sunday and actually stretching that racing defence a little bit and playing with high tempo. Yeah, it'll be very interesting to see exactly what it's happens. It's a very difficult, difficult and scenario from now and then. The odds are that, you know, unless unless they produce some sort of performance, which we haven't seen recently, um, the they've gone out gone. of Europe. Yeah. Um, and we wait to see what the injury report is like as well, because obviously Conway went off injured in that game. Um, uh, Connacht at the moment have a massive injury crisis, one of the types of injury crises that, you know, it's so bad, that it's it's remarkable. In rugby, you're going to have a certain number of days every year that you expect your players to be out for, but Connacht are feeling the pinch at the minute. Is there anything that can be done to add a number of players to their playing squad? Is there something that, like... Yeah, I'm not sure. I think um, it's probably... Again, it's a really crucial couple of weeks for them, and and they've had a they've had a, a really dreadful kind of run of injuries. They've just mounted up week after week, and and a lot of that power and kind of influence up front has been gone. Fainga, Jared Butler, Quinn Rue, Delan was out for a while. Um, they've just had a lot of injuries, number of props out, um, and they've been really really stretched. I think they. You'd have to have empathy for Andy Friend. Um, I think they had 26 fit players to, to choose from at the weekend between the player welfare and the injuries scenario, 22 missing. So it's always going to be really difficult for them to, to, to go to the RDS and play a side full of confidence and, <coughs> and, uh, and belief in themselves and quality as well. So I, I'm not sure if, because they have a fair number of, 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 um, of overseas players, I think they whether they get some short-term help or it depends on how long certain players are out for. Um, but it's it's a really tough situation. It shows the gap and the difference of where Leinster are at at the moment and Connacht, um, which is, there was a lot of optimism a number of weeks ago, but Connacht are really being hammered now by those injuries. And, and they're, you know, they're, it's a legitimate reason why they're really, really struggling at the moment. Yeah, we've got the game against Toulouse live and off the ball on Saturday, uh, Leinster against Leon is on Sunday. We also have Villa against Manchester City on Sunday as well. So, um, a quick word about um, Leinster before we go. Like, it's, it's hard to know how good they are at the moment because they keep hammering teams 40 points up at half-time. They were sensational, but obviously it's a very weakened Connacht kind of side. And um, their game at the weekend against Leon, they know exactly that they're already through. They need to get a bonus point. They need to keep racking up the bonus point wins to make sure that they've got home advantage as long as that lasts in the number one seed. Um, but they're pretty good at the minute, right? Yeah, the most impressive thing for me is, is and, and I think the other coaches, Johan van Graan was talking about the changes, they're affecting the other provinces more, particularly Connacht and Munster. I think Ulster have had a bit more consistency in selection. As I said, bar that second stroke, third string that they send down to the RDS. Which still scored 35 points or 40 points. Yeah, it they did. And I think, well, it can happen when you're... You throw, you know, the opposition dropped their standard a little bit, and and they, they a few a few things went right for them, and they scored tries. And look, they're, they're decent players, and ex young players coming through will always throw the ball around. But I think the most impressive thing for Leinster is is the performance doesn't change when you have the number of changes, and that's down to co good coaching, um, really good application, everybody knowing their job inside out. And I think their biggest strength strength is the collective, because. And I mean this respectfully. There's not, 
There's no big physical monsters in that Leinster side who would really physically dominate you or hurt you. But what they do and the way they're coached and the, the, the accuracy around their carries, their clean outs, their lines of running is just superb. So System and culture. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, they're very good players. That doesn't. I'm, I'm just saying there's no big yeah. Bruno Pola brother, uh, one of those guys yeah, you running take out, out the team, over you. Yeah. yeah, so they can. They, it's the system that the players are just being so have so bought into it so much. They're they're obviously outstanding players. You look at someone like um, you know Will Connors slips into the team the way he started this year. Um, Max Deegan. A couple of weeks ago we were saying Kellen Doris was outstanding for him in a couple of games yeah. and that he's called into the Irish squad and I think Max Deegan made 29 tackles the other night, missed none, 20 carries, uh, two tries. Does, does he start when, when everybody's fit in that back row? It's phenomenal. I don't know who starts yeah, on. That's no a good one knows. question. That's Nobody thing. knows who starts when they're all fit. Right. Five past nine this morning, Alan. Thanks very much for that uh, here on OTBM. Just a reminder, if you miss anything from the show, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can watch it back because all of our best stuff goes up there. You can also subscribe to the OTBM podcast which is timestamped wherever you get your pods, iTunes, Spotify, off the wall.com, or the best place to get us, which is the Go Loud app, because that's where OTB Sports Radio lives, which is our sports radio station that's live 24 hours a day. We've got Deal or No Deal before 9.30 this morning. Up next, it's NFL after Wildcard Weekend with Mike Carlson. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. They spoke about your arm not being down beside your side. I mean, this is not Irish dancing. OTB Sports Radio. Basketball would have been my main game. The brand new sports radio station from Off The Ball. That's my point. Don't play for us if you're a proud Englishman. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Live on the Go Loud app. Alexa. You have a whole new world of possibilities. Google Home. Tune in. And offtheball.com slash radio. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB AM. Well, there was a series of events midway through the fourth quarter when about two minutes came off the clock uh, before the punt. Uh, what did you see there, and is that something that you'd like yeah, to we've see? We've talked about this before. It's the same thing we've talked about before. There's no change. You said before that that might be a loophole the NFL could close. Any further thoughts on that? No. Hi, Bill. Um, I know this is a disappointing evening for you, um, but Pat's Nation, your fans, have, have stuck with you through thick, thick and thin um, social media. It just They still love you. Do you have any message for the fans who have, are so, so supportive of you and the team? Yeah, we appreciate our fans. Um, I wouldn't say it's been all that thin around here personally. Maybe you feel differently, but I, I haven't heard too many fans say that, so... Um, yeah, of course we appreciate our fans. That's you know we have a great relationship with them. They're here for us, and we always try to perform our best so they can be proud of the way we perform. If uh, if you get the opportunity to dig out the Bill Belichick press conference from the post match of the Tennessee Titans, then I suggest you do. It's a, a masterpiece in um, saying nothing but being very very angry about stuff. Mike Carlson, good morning to you. How you doing? Um, I'm moving on to the next week of the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm on to Cincinnati, except there's no more Cincinnati for Bill Belichick this week or for Tom Brady. Just very briefly, that we, no. we played that clip. The, the start of that clip was him being asked about two minutes coming off the clock. And um, there are memes now going around the internet of him doing this, where he took two minutes off the clock with a series of fouls and penalties against the Jets. And his, his face is like, ah, oh, look at me, I've just told a great joke. <laughs> and then he was absolutely livid that it was happening to him, that his protege was doing unto him what he had done unto the Jets. Um, you know, what goes around comes around. Oh, exactly. Uh, it's a copycat league. And, you know, usually when when Bill innovates something or comes up with a, a loophole in the rules he can exploit, the quote unquote competition committee immediately makes it illegal or everybody else starts doing it, deferring it, you know, deferring the first half uh, kickoff choice, all kinds, all kinds of things over the year, jumping over the center to block a field goal. Um, you know, it, it's a constant process. And I think he was more angry that, um, that Mike Rabel was doing it you know, um, than the fact that it could be done. He he had to kind of accept, accept that. But um, it, it's it was a good strategy. Happy New Year, guys. I'm yes, back thank in you. My, yeah. my, normal, my normal mode, not my Bill Belichick mode. Um, but, you know, the reality was 
he won a division and went 12 and four uh, with a team that wasn't very good. Um, and I think we saw that in the second half of the year when teams realized that, you know, if they could score more than 14 points against the Patriots, they had a pretty good shot at winning, you know, and even so you could look at this game against the Titans. You could look at the game against Kansas city for sure. Um, you could even look at the Edelman fumble in Baltimore as being a game turnaround. They were in game, you know, the old Patriots would have won those, won those games, but this year's Patriots just couldn't do that when they were, when they had the opportunity to put these games away. Remember Tennessee's offense only scored 13 points in this game. Um, you know, the game was there to be won. Is this the end is like the Brady's press conference was very interesting as well because he got asked exactly the same question in exactly the same format. Your fans love you. Social media says you're amazing. They stuck through you through bad times. She said uh, she changed her changed her question the next time when it came to um, to Brady, and he was like, "Look, I don't know what the future is. I, you know, I don't know if he's negotiating here or if actually this could be the end, and maybe that's the right thing for the Patriots." Yeah, I don't think Brady is finished if he doesn't want to be. Um, you know, lots of people are saying that he, he he's um, he can't make the throws. He can't do do this or that. He is a different quarterback and he's he's one who's obviously in decline, but he still has skills. He he was still making I mean, the throw to the sidelines to Edelman was a perfectly great throw. And Edelman turns around and then drops it. So it's an incompletion in NFL terms. It would have been a fumble in in my world of reality. But that's that's another story. Um He's pretty much at the point where Peyton Manning was when Manning left Indianapolis for two years at Denver. And his first year at Denver, you remember, he was very effective, got to the Super Bowl, and they got killed by the Ravens. The next year, he was completely ineffective, shared time with Brock Osweiler, but they got to the Super Bowl and won it. And I think Brady's in that same position. So there's a number of variables here, the biggest one being what other teams might want him. Um, who might bring him in as a one or possibly two year fix, knowing he's going to be very expensive if they do. Uh, the second thing is what are New England going to do in terms of next year's team? And this goes beyond t team building where they did not a good job this year. And some of that was beyond their control, losing David Andrews to an illness rather than injury. Gronk making a late decision to retire, which didn't really let them address it in, in, in a number of ways. But, does Bill Belichick lose Josh McDaniels, for example, to another team as head coach? Does he lose Nick Casario as general as the de facto general manager who, you know, wanted to go to Houston last year but but was still under contract? Um, Brady and McDaniels obviously have a relationship and that could that could affect things uh as well. Do they want to pay Brady knowing how much he's probably going to cost? You know, there's the much vaunted home team discount with Tom Brady. He doesn't need the money per se. But if San Diego say, if Philip Rivers leaves San Diego and San Diego say, well, you know, we've played the last few years with an old quarterback who can't move in the pocket and Rivers probably has a bit more arm than Brady. But but, you know, maybe that's a good that would be a good move if they offer him 30 million a year for two years. Do the Patriots match that? Yeah, knowing they've, that they're they've... Uh, a new stadium to fill in, in L.A. as well, of course. And, and they actually yeah. have receiving talent that, and a, a running back who he could dump the ball off to who would be amazing for him. So you could see... Yeah, a, a... Although, yeah, although a lousy offensive line, a line that's worse than the Patriots' offensive line, but they can address that in the offseason. Yeah. And they can say to Brady, we're, we're addressing that. You know, there will be other teams who are, who are possibly interested in, in Tom Brady. That'll be an interest. So then he sits down with Kraft and presumably with Belichick, and they say, well, what are you guys going to do? Um, and is it worth my suffering for another two years here for 20 million a year or whatever you're going to offer me? Or should I go into the sun and, and get, you know, get 30 million or more um, with a team that's going to build themselves around me for a year or two? It's, it's going to be a really fascinating discussion. But the one thing I don't think is going to happen is that he's going to retire. It's funny that um, Joe Montana obviously left uh, the San Francisco 49ers when they were still a dynasty and went off and had a, a great career with Kansas and led them to a, a championship game. But the 49ers had Steve Young who were kind of forcing him out. The Patriots don't have a replacement on the books at the moment. So like, it's not an obvious thing for them to, to usher him out, is it? No, not obvious at all. Um, Jared Stidham looked good in preseason, but when they gave him a you know a brief trial during the season, he looked like a rookie, a fourth round rookie, which is what he was. Remember, Brady was, <laughs> you know, Brady was even further down in the draft than that. Um, 
now there are veteran quarterbacks around who they could bring in. I mean, it would be, what would be interesting would be if they signed Philip Rivers and Brady went to the Chargers. That 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 to me, I was that scenario popped up in my mind uh, while I was watching the game on Saturday. Um, the other thing is that a lot of the problems the Patriots have was I think is down to their their difficulty with breaking in young players not just at the skill positions, but pre- predominantly at the skill positions. And with receivers, there's a you have to have Brady's trust in that offense. And if he doesn't trust you, he won't throw to you. And he seemed incredibly reluctant to throw the ball, you know, to almost anyone. Um, and in the end, wound up throwing to Edelman as much as possible um, to uh, Ben Watson, who dropped who dropped a ball toward the end of toward the end of the game. Um, like Edelman, which which both were were crucial drops, to Sanu, who obviously was not worth a second round draft pick. They did throw a lot to Nikhil Harry, um, and uh, Jacoby Jacoby Myers never never even took the field. The young receivers, but you know, like a lot of teams in these playoffs, they they didn't throw, they couldn't throw to their wide receivers. Um, no wide receiver for Tennessee had more than one catch in that game. Um, and nobody says, you know, they've got a huge wide receiver problem. I'm just looking down the uh, the line. You know, no one but Michael Thomas um, for the uh, Saints had more more than one catch. Uh, you know, we're, it's a funny kind of league where the Eagles, for example, can have their receive, wide receiver core decimated, you know, and still play tough um, offensively. And the Patriots can yeah. with pretty much the same because they didn't have tight ends to go to. Yeah. Yeah, you know, so they had to just throw to running backs and Julian Edelman. You can't win like that. So, so is this not a really liberating moment for the Patriots then that they can get rid of a quarterback, set him off into the sunset, the greatest of all time? Well done. We've loved your contribution uh, to this franchise, and Bill Belichick can then step up because, I, like, I, I would see this as a very attra- attractive proposition for any quarterback coming in to work with somebody like Bill Belichick. I think it's far more attractive than. Uh, a coach at the moment wanting to work with Tom Brady or trying to uh, provide an offense around Tom Brady for the reasons you've just listed. Yeah, if I were Bill, if if I were um, Bill Belichick and un, unsecure, insecure about my future, about the way the future is going to see me, I would sign Marcus Mariota and win a Super Bowl with Marcus Mariota at quarterback. But I, I, I don't think that's how he's he's motivated. I think there'll be a lot of. Um, pressure within the organization to keep Brady with the Patriots for his whole career. Um, you know, the, the crafts, the crafts, um, will think that this will be the real test of Bill Belichick's, uh, ruthlessness, shall we say, in terms of getting rid of players before their value, you know, before their, um, decline begins rather than after Brady has been the exception and that, and now you're talking about the exception who's going to require big, big money, to be kept. So it's a double exception for Belichick. And this will be, I think, a, a real definer for his career, even though, you know, he's at he's nearing the end of his career. Yeah. And I mentioned McDaniels, you know, McDaniels is theoretically, or at least, you know, by rumor has been promised the head coaching job when Bill retires, but Bill coaches till he's 87. <laughs> it's, you know, it's kind of like the queen and Prince Charles. You yeah. Know? <laughs> it's like he could be waiting the rest of his life to become a head coach. It, we've got about a minute left here, Mike. What, uh, what else from the weekend should we be talking about? Is it DK Metcalf? Is it, is it the Vikings finally winning a big game in a tight spot? What, what is your big takeaway? Yeah, um, well, I think the Saints lose another game in a tight spot. I think that's one takeaway. Um, Drew Brees' fumble, fumble. if it were Brady, everybody would say, be saying he was finished. And I think it was kind of a fluke because I think he got hit directly under the arm yeah. and, and his arm went numb, and that's why, why the ball came out. Um, but for me, um, I think Minnesota is probably your, your best story. I don't see much future for any of these teams going through to the next round. Um, I think you'd have to be optimistic and the Vikings with maybe are the best team probably of the bunch, but they're going to be on a short week playing on the road again in San Francisco. That's going to be a, a real tough task for them. Um, and I think uh, you just saw DK Metcalf. You mentioned Seattle put a rookie in 
and they they basically bring him along. And yes, Harry N- Nikhil Harry for the Patriots missed the first half of the season with injury, but you just saw how Metcalf developed during you know the weak points of his college game became strong points for the Seahawks. And and Russell Wilson needs a big play receiver. They won that game based on two big plays to Nikhil to um, DK Metcalf. The Patriots had no big play receiver. They lost to the Titans as as a result. And oh, one good word for Derrick Henry, you know, uh, to go into New England and win completing eight passes, um, you know, is is in large part down to Derrick Henry just simply being unstoppable in, in terms of controlling uh, controlling the game. And I, I really like watching old school football. And that was old school football. Mike, great stuff. Great to have you with us. We'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks oh, a million. Always good. Thanks, guys. It's uh, Mike Carlson with us. Uh, time for a bit of uh, deal or no deal. I signed for them after the Euros and after my first day's training on a driving home, I was actually thinking, regretting it, what have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Right. I like that sexy new sting. Happy New Year, Phil. Happy New Year, lads. Welcome back. Deal or no deal, Phil? Deal. Manchester United. Manchester United England midfielder Jesse Lingard could be on the way out of Old Trafford, but he's got the moves. He's got the moves, he's got the clothes, and he's got the, uh, is it Shore? Is it, is it head, head and Shoulders? Whatever campaign he's gone. The Sunday Mirror reported the club wants to pawn him off as part of a mega deal comprised of the attacker and 45 million in exchange for Leicester City's Irish qualified, maybe, we're not sure, James Madison. It has since emerged via the mail that the 27-year-old Lingard is now a Mino Raiola footballer with the involvement of the super agent increasing speculation that Jesse is on the move. Does Lingard plus 45 million over or undervalue Madison and is there any chance this deal will happen? No. Lingard no. is going to leave though. No. Because if, when, when Raiola, when Raiola takes, takes you on... Out the of context, reason, Phil Egan. Yeah. No. <laughs> the reason he is uh, taking you on is because he's going to get you a move. Because Mino needs to, if he wants to make money, you got to move. Yeah. But if you're Leicester, it makes no sense. He's going to Wolves, isn't he? Oh, no, that's, that's Mendes, is it? Or is that Raiola? Who's the... Mendes as well. Mendes, Mendes yeah. Is, yeah. Right, OK. Will Manchester United fans be glad to see the back of Jesse Lingard? Yes. What, Young Jesse Lingard. How much is James Madison worth? Um, in the current climate, he's probably worth over 50 million. So if you're Leicester and he is going to go at some stage, then you, you say to... Any buyers? Cash only. Cash only. None of because, your pawn off. Yeah, they don't want Man United Jesse wage. Lingard. They've got good midfielders already. Je- Jesse Lingard is going to end up Everton. becoming a decent Everton player. I don't know because I have a feeling we'll be talking about Everton in a few minutes, and there's another option on the table. But, I mean, at some stage in his career. Well, it's now or never for the purposes of this segment. Like he's he's not actually young. He's 27. Good point, in fairness. <laughs> Good, like, you can't really argue with that. He's 27. Yeah. So he's going to sign for, like, uh, the next team that comes up from the championship. Yeah, well, well she- Sheffield United seem to be taking on these players that can... Now, he's... I'm not putting him in the same category as Morrison or, or Rodwell because, you know, he's he hasn't... Um, like, Morrison obviously went off the rails. Rodwell's been injured. But... Um, like, let, let's just focus on the fact that Jesse Lingard is 27 for a moment here. Like, we, we, we often, <laughs> He's older than you! Like, I was just about to say, like, we, we all try to avoid sounding like you're a da because 19-year-olds are doing 19-year-old things. I genuinely was forgiving of Jesse Lingard because that's what 19-year-olds do. He's older than me! Yeah! yeah. The, the guy needs to, to grow up, like, I mean, fair play in the, the clothing line and all that, but the em, 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 embarrassing Marbella video with uh, Marcus Rashford, when even Marcus Rashford looked Kind of embarrassed to be in his company at that point. Yeah, he's got. He, he had one purple patch under Mourinho where people were calling him Messi Lingard mm. in December 2018. Was it? Yes, yeah. exactly. Where he, he was, he had an unbelievable month, and that's as good as it got. Um, Post World Cup, deal or no deal? Wild cards and Serie A leaders Inter Milan may win the hunt to secure Paul Pogba's signature. We got a Paul Pogba bumper update here. <laughs> Mirror Sport report that Antonio Conte has been told that the Red Devils want striker Lautaro Martinez as part of a deal for Pogba. I may have butchered the uh, Christian name there. The 22-year-old Argentine forward is also believed to be a Barca target and valued at some 80 million quid. Yeah, this guy is one of the hottest properties right now. But Lautaro. I can't see how he's going to United. Let me, let me, I'm not finished. This is, I said bumper, Phil. <laughs> Pogba's links with Real Madrid are live again. 
The gospel columns say Manchester United won 30-year-old Tony Cruz as part of a potential deal with Spanish giants. I'm a big fan of Tony Cruz. They should get him. Meanwhile, Juve will reportedly offer midfielder Rabio 24 in a player plus cash deal for Pogba. Ole insists the French star will not leave in this window, either with his people or without them. Do any of these links sound legitimate? And who makes the biggest impact at Man United? Martinez, Cruz, or Rabio? Martinez obviously is the youngest and is more one for the future. Tony Crowes goes in and <coughs> makes the midfield better straight away. Yeah. He's 30, but Matic is 31. You get two or three good years out of Crowes. You get four years out of Tony Crowes. He's, he's an unbelievable player. If you've got good players around them, I know Matic is quite slow. Crowes isn't as immobile as Matic. Plus, if you've got young players around them, yeah. they're going to learn from one of the best players midfielders in, in world football. Rabio, any good? I don't think there's been a gossip column written since 2003 that doesn't have the name Adrian Rabio written at this point. You have to say he struggled at two consecutive clubs. Yeah. He's Just, if he goes to United, it will be not very good because there's obviously an issue with his attitude. And unfortunately, United have had too many players. <laughs> They've got that. plenty of that already. Yeah. So they don't need a player like Adrian Rabio. And I, I remember when I, I saw him playing for PSG, in the flesh before and I thought this lad is he's decent but he's one of those players he's going to look better in a better team yeah. because he'll rarely give the ball away where do you want to see Pogba play? anywhere but Manchester United because I'm just sick of talking about him but like honestly where would you let's, 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 let's let the Tony Crowes trade happen yeah. and get him he's into Real Madrid he's the archetypal Real Madrid player he will be a superstar for Real Madrid he'll win two Champions Leagues they'll not win a league while he's there no. and it'll be brilliant it'll be beautiful oh well let's go and see us it, it will Come be on. Bu it will be bucket list drama yes Gareth Bale on the golf club Pogba at his, at his mate's ah, wedding. Pogba dancing. Week like, in, week out. It would be sensational. You bring, bring back the kind of needless Galactico era. Yes. 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 Zizou. Yeah. All, all he needed was Zizou. That's what I, you'd say. Stop this signing 19 and 20 year old brilliant Brazilians. Brazilians. Start signing over the hill, but like ready to do one last magnificent seven tour. Like Paul Pogba, it's perfect. Uh, install Wenger slash Mourinho as manager. One last, one last Manchester United note. They're linked with Sporting Lisbon's Bruno Fernandes, which dominated the summer, have returned to the headlines. This is one which we will be monitoring, and we're not asking for a deal or no deal on that just yet. Because but he doesn't exist, probably. If you want to give me a, a yeah. bonus one, go for it. No, he's... I, I saw him playing he, for he Sporting. Definitely this, exists, like he definitely Just checking. Yeah, he has a Wikipedia page. So when I watched exists. him playing for Sporting this season, there was very much a feel of a player that didn't really want to be there. Turned it on at moments. You could see the, potent, like the, the quality there. So... He'll definitely want to get out of sport. We're into rapid fire now. Two more quick internotes. Determined and continue to be linked with a move for Ericsson, potentially paying 20 million now to bag him before his contract runs out. Chelsea made into Milan's Brazil striker Gabriel Barbosa their top January target, according to the Express. Irish international Troy Parrott didn't clock up any minutes in the FA Cup, but has made the gossip columns. Whoa. Um, sorry, my phone smashed and it's a new one. Uh, I don't know how to turn it off. Humble uh, brag. There you it's like go. The Jim White moment. He's the Everton the deals. Yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah, Pogba <laughs> to Madrid. I mean, no. Done, done deal. Uh, the Everton, the Evening Standard reports that Troy Parrott is set to sign a major new deal at Spurs with a year and a half left in his current contract. Bayern Munich and Borussia Dortmund have been linked with the 17 year old. Do we want to see him sign a Spurs deal and see him loaned out following Joseph's comments about him not being ready for the first team? Or do we want to see him go to Bayern Munich? We want to see him loaned out from Tottenham Hotspur. Uh, I was wrong about Jose. This is not going to work out, is it? And it's going to happen. It but it quickly. turns out it wasn't Pochettino. No. It was the lack of investment in the squad. Reports from France suggest that Arsenal have formally contacted Bayern Munich to register their interest in the 31 year old German Jerome Boateng. Owen, would he fit into Arteta's new look Wolfpack defence? Uh, he would. They've, they're kind of putting the freeze on signing defenders at the moment, though, because they've got Saliba coming back from San Etienne next year. Also in from Upa Meccano. The Liverpool end. fans are excited at the prospect of signing Usman Dembele after the Barcelona star liked a mocked-up picture of him wearing a Reds kit on Instagram. The Frenchman's future at the new Camp is up in the air. Phil, does this hilarious. mean... What? Did you see this? Yeah, this, does this mean Dembele will be a Red, and where would he fit into the club formula? There he is, he's after scoring from another assist from Trent Alexander-Arnold. Oh. He'd, he'd be perfect for Liverpool in terms of the style of play. I wonder what Klopp would make him as a, a human. That's one thing that it seems Klopp to be important. Looks at. But do you know what? You look at a couple of players Barca have signed. They've paid over 100 million for Coutinho and Dembele. Didn't and work. It hasn't worked out for them. 
Now Dembele has had injuries, but I think Barcelona fans actually really like him. They see the potential he's there. Very young still. He's so quick. He'd be he'd be exactly. You, you could see him fitting into the Liverpool team. Olivier Giroud, 33, allowed to leave. Chelsea being linked with a move to solve Aston Villa's injury crisis. Can he save the Villa? Yes, he can. No, he can't. Olivier Giroud can save anything. They're going to they're gonna sign him and they will regret it forever, like most of the signings they've ever made. Wesley and Giroud. Uh, Diego Simeone has not ruled out Atletico interest in 24-year-old French midfielder Thomas Lamar, who's been linked with Tottenham and Arsenal. Does the prospect of him arriving... I mean, come on. Like, it's not 2015 anymore, but yeah, come on, big name, let's go for it. James is an Everton target. A loan deal could bring the Colombian to Liverpool. Yes or no? They need him. Watch him no Yeah, get it done. He's 28. He's only 28. He's the same age as Jesse Lingard, basically. But you're older. He might be Good just a bit better than Gilfie Sigurdsson. Hit it. I signed for them after the Euros. And after my first day's training, I was driving home. I was actually thinking... Regretting it? What have I done? I like I walked into a circus. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, that's pretty much us for uh, today. And that's any final thoughts you want to give us? You want to do, start doing some moral final thoughts like Jerry Springer at the end of the show? Not really. I just want to wish everybody a happy new year. Hope everybody has uh, a happy and healthy and prosperous Christmas period. Wow. 25 going on 40. Hey, 929 this morning. That's it from us here on OTBAM. Thank you very much for joining us. We're back on your radios tonight from 7 o'clock on Newstalk. You can subscribe to the OTBAM podcast, fully timestamp, making it very easy to find exactly what you want from this morning's two hour show. If you missed anything, the sports pages talking Mickey Hart on Colin McShane, Irish football with Keith Andrews, rugby with Alan Quinlan, Deal or No Deal, and the end of the Patriots dynasty. We have to say dynasty with Mike Carlson. You'll find it on podcasts, also on YouTube. You can cast us onto your smart TV. Remember, OTBM, Ireland's first and only sports breakfast show, back tomorrow morning from 7 30. We'll see you then. Good luck. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports.